It's time for Mac Break Weekly, a Fat Tuesday edition with lots of great information. We'll talk about the iWatch rumor, the lawsuit from Apple shareholders, and why Tim Cook isn't building a car. It's all coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 337, recorded February 12th, 2013. Put another book on the fire. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by LegalZoom.com. LegalZoom is not a law firm. LegalZoom provides self-help services at your direction, like affordable business and personal documents you can trust. Visit LegalZoom.com and use the offer code MBW to receive $10 off at checkout. And by Squarespace, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website, blog, or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to Squarespace.com. And use the offer code MACBREAK2. And don't forget to try their newly launched developer platform for complete cold control. And buy Carbonite Online Backup. Automatic, continual, unlimited backup for your computer files. Only $59 a year. Try it free at Carbonite.com. And use the offer code MACBREAK to get two bonus months with purchase. And buy Ring Central. I love my cloud-based phone system from Ring Central. Zero startup costs and Ring Central is $20 per month per user. Try it now with a 30-day risk-free trial. When you buy one desk phone, you'll get a second phone free up to 20 phones. Call 800-543-9980 or visit ringcentral.com and use our promo code TWIT. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we talk about all the Apple news and rumors and so forth, and we've got a great team to do it. Visiting us from Liverpool, Mr. Don McAllister of Screencasts Online. Hi, Don. Hello, Leo. Hi. Good and, to see uh, you. It's a pity I'm only virtually visiting you this uh, this time. I was there uh, two weeks ago for Macworld, but I didn't make it in time for the show, unfortunately. Uh, I, I'm you. sorry, but that's okay. So I was wondering, you did go to Macworld. I yes. World. Yeah. Yep. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. Certainly did. As I came over on the... Uh, I actually travelled on the Tuesday. That's why I couldn't make it onto the show. And that's then I uh, came back on the Sunday. So I was there for the for the full three days. Awesome. And worth it? Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, yeah. It's still a good show. I know it has changed significantly since Apple left, but uh, it's still a great event, and you know the people there are fantastic, and it's, it's always good to meet up with old buddies and make new ones. As everybody well. says it's the people now. It's about the people. And some good kit there as well. I mean, the, the show floor uh, was was very busy. Um, <laughs> obviously, no great big announcements or anything, but you know it's always interesting to see what's going on. And uh, the tech talks were very successful this year as well. Uh, I actually gave one this year, but I know that most of the sessions that I visited. Um, attendance was really, it seemed more than last year, actually, in, in the hmm. talk sessions. I think, Renee, you agree. That was, uh, Renee Ritchie is also here from iMore.com, and he came down from Montreal for Macworld, iWorld. Absolutely, and I got to meet Don, and I got to meet a lot of Indeed. other people that I have only met virtually or as talking heads on the Twit Network, and I got to put actual bodies on them, and that was fantastic. It's true, we're just floating heads here, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy and I and Don are. Yeah. Andy, Andy and Akko is here from the Chicago Sun-Times, and... Uh, this beautiful snowbound uh, Boston area. Hello, Andy. Uh, a little less snow than uh, than on on Saturday, but again, we're made did of party you, pioneer stars. Did you lose power or uh, utilities this time? Or yep, lost lost a Friday night, uh, which was a bigger problem because the house is electrically heated. Uh, fortunately, we have, we have a wood burning stove. I put in. I I brought in lot, enough firewood to to last me through the night. It was like eight. It was eight degrees outside. Uh, the the interesting part of that was the time when I'm just sitting around this darkened house, you know, and thinking, oh yeah, it's going to be eight degrees tonight. I should take my soda out of the pantry in the kitchen and move it into the fridge. <laughs> so the so it'll be, ins it'll be so warm. It'll be insulated <laughs> against the cold. Yes. <laughs> so. So it was it was also good it was also a good opportunity to like go through like my bookcases and you know if if in the if in the past five years you set you've sent me like a training book on a piece of software that hasn't been made for at least two years I I'm sorry I burned it I my, did you really my Adobe, <laughs> my Adobe Photoshop four book well I I had firewood but you know 
you have this, you know, I'm sure you, you guys have this problem too, where you have books that you just so keep much. for no apparently yeah. reason. I'm not talking yeah. about like new Bible books. I'm talking about like Claris works, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, the Delphi <laughs> 3 Super Bible. I'm not going to be doing it. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you, you never get around to it and say, well, I wonder, I wonder how well that will burn. Well, what do you know? It will burn very nicely. <laughs> crackle, Although I, crackle. Did, I did, I did. And the, the other fun was that every time I, I only burned like maybe five or six books. And again, not because I was burning them for heat, but because, okay, that'll stretch out my firewood a little bit more. And also it'll like, revive the fire when you add it but every time every time I, the other win was every time i put another book on the fire i had to do my you know dr henry jones it means that goose stepping morons like you should try <laughs> reading books instead of burning them and i had a good laugh and i was still cold but it was, i had a good laugh it's like fahrenheit 451 in there <laughs> i'm just happy you didn't have to eat the squirrel to stay oh, alive God, I, I I have I have to I have to pity whoever's job it was like at the end of that book to have to memorize you know <laughs> I, I, iOS five point one for <laughs> the the expert Bible for all eight hundred pages. There, there are Goodman, some books Hyper you really don't Bible. don't need to preserve. I think is the exactly. point. Yeah, <laughs> put another. <laughs> that's the title of the show, by the way. I've already decided. Put another book on the fire. I think it's perfect. <laughs> perfect. Um, all right, we could do, let's see, we could do rumors. We certainly got the rumor expert. We could do jailbreaking. We could do news from Apple. We could do the big lawsuit, which Tim Cook calls a silly sideshow. We could talk Jeopardy. about the watch rumor. Let's start with a watch rumor. I think mm -hmm. that's a, that's a like juicy one to start with. Leo. Yeah, rumors for 400. <laughs> uh, this comes from, it started with Nick Bilton in the New York Times, quoting, uh, it sounds like quoting Han High, Foxconn. Uh, saying that Apple was making a curved glass smartwatch. Wall Street Journal said, "Yeah, we know that. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we read, we read that. I mean, is that we we got. Yeah, we have the story. And of course, once the Times and Journal say it, it's got to be true. But I'm more interested in what Renee Ritchie has to say. What do you think? Yeah. Well, my my standard answer is that Apple is a really really smart company, and they're always working, you know, two to five years in the future. And if there is any product category that you can think of that they may want to one day be in, they've probably got the ten designs and working on the three prototypes, and they're locked in the lab next to the television sets and the i espresso makers and everything else that they're toying with. But the timing, I think, is interesting um, because the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times are usually organizations that, you know, they softly, not softly, but they get they get told certain things at certain times. And whether it's to mitigate against what a competitor is doing or to, you know, assuage Wall Street fears that the great era of Apple innovation is over, uh, I think it is telling that both those those papers do have rumors at the same time. You're saying these rumors come from Apple PR as... A form of manipulation. I think sometimes. I, I, I mean, it's it's hard to say that exactly, but we all remember when the iPad was rumored. You know, before the iPhone, the iPhone was rumored. Then the iPad was rumored, and it was rumored at a thousand dollars. Right. Then it came out at five hundred dollars, and oh my goodness, how yeah. cheap is Boy, that? Boy, that does seem cheap when we <laughs> <laughs> compare it to the thousand we thought it would be. Right. So there's yeah, I think there's it's a lot of expectation setting. Yes. Yeah, expectation setting. That's a nice way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah, think that... So it's, the, it's the new Apple TV, though, isn't it? That's, that's the thing that's annoying me now. Everyone's jumping on the, the right. iWatch bandwagon. And it's exactly the same as you know when the Apple TV rumors came out, you know, the big screen Apple TV. Everybody now has to have their uh, iWatch story. And I, I, think the thing, I think the catalyst to this is, is, is this little beauty, because I actually got mine a couple of days ago. So you got the, the Pebble. Pebble, yeah. And, oh, um, and he's got his... Clarice right. watch, <laughs> the dog cow <laughs> watch, an act, but it, that is an actual yeah. like licensed. Apple it's an Apple product. watch. It's got the Apple logo on it. Right. That, was, that was like one of the last things that app, when uh, Steve Jobs came back, one of the first things he did was kill like all the licensing. Yeah. yeah. And did so you, you blow an no embargo on that, Marco? Design in Cupertino, <laughs> made in Switzerland. Yes. <laughs> yes. Made in China, of course. Yeah. Yeah, that Andy always upstages us, doesn't he? He always has the gear. And I bet great. he's actually got an Apple Watch under his desk. Get the though, Apple Watch. You mean something like this? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> if it looks like that, I don't want. <laughs> yeah, see, this is. I think. I think this is what we're expecting, <laughs> like from Apple Digital Watch. It's about uh, just for people listening at home. It's a, it's the size of a small television. It's got. It's yeah, about it's, as. Thick. It's about a, like like a fun size Snickers bar. Yeah. It's like it's with the on hand with, wrist PC. Is that a from, spot? Like, watch what is that no no on no it's, it's, it's the on hand wrist pc it, it 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 was very i don't know if it ran palm but it ran something very similar it to has palm. a stylus it doesn't it developer. no it has like a little five but like a uh, little uh like a little uh, joystick here like a five button uh right. joystick here wow uh and 
runs on a stack of like CR2035 cells, like three of them inside there that would run for <laughs> practically nothing. And even so, even though even though this was like an LCD screen, it, it doesn't tell you the time until you sort of like nudge this uh, button to like get it to wake up. <laughs> And so but, but, imagine me but, like going through going through an airport with like <laughs> I've got I've got like my rolling my luggage in my and one hand with this one I have to sort of like lift up my wrist and sort of like bang it against my chin just to find out if I'm going to make my flight or not. <laughs> but but let's face it, it, it is a, it is a chick magnet, isn't it? <laughs> well, attached to this, <laughs> it literally on. has a magnet in it. <laughs> Come to me, chick. Uh, yeah, it's sexy. Uh, I think Don is, is right that, that we are in a. Really Go ahead, We're in a hit-driven business for Apple. I mean, it's, it's always, what have you done for me lately? They're going to make the phone. They made the phone. Where's the tablet? Okay, here's a tablet. Where's the TV? Where's the watch? And it's some combination of them having done a lot of high-profile products, but also this really strange expectation from customers in Wall Street. If you look at Amazon and their price-to-earnings ratio, and they've never been profitable compared to Apple, who makes heaps and tons of money. Uh, but the expectation is always what is next from Apple. So I think there is some pressure to, even if there's not something coming next, to have the appearance of things that are always in the pipeline. Do you think it's significant? I guess you do, that the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times floated this rumor, which would otherwise be pretty much, I mean, look, we, everybody would publish it and we'd, we might even talk about it, but everybody would point out, you know, app, as you did, Apple makes a lot of prototypes. Doesn't mean they're going to market with it. It's a it, it is a fairly advanced step to take it to Han High and say, let's make this because... That means, well, we're thinking enough about it that we want to see if it's producible, if we could produce it, right? I believe they have television prototypes, too. I mean, right. I, they're, they're a very hands-on company. Most of the stuff that, I mean, as much as Johnny Ive makes wonderful stuff, he also makes the machines that makes wonderful stuff. Right. Their design department does a lot of incredible things, and they're they have huge to. fans of prototyping. Yeah. So, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's odd at all that some of this stuff is in the design stage. There's that old quote, 10 one you make 10 designs, three prototypes one product and there could be something along uh that stage of release that people are are talking about i like that so it's at three not ten yeah but it's not one yet either no, now a couple of people have weighed in on this ryan block back, way back when apple killed the square nano that people were wearing as a wristwatch um and then there, and people said why why they, you know that's your first step towards your wearable uh what you know computer Ryan Block said, "No, no, this makes perfect sense. They're going to kill that because it's, it's people are using it that way, but it's in a, it's not as good as it's gonna it could be. So they made something not wearable, and that's he thought definite indication that Apple's looking at making a wearable, you know, watch. And then now ask Tog uh, Tognazini, uh, Bruce Tognazini, who's a longtime Apple uh, guy and uh, Apple watcher. Now he says the iWatch will fill a gaping hole in the Apple ecosystem." It will facilitate and coordinate not... Now, he's not speaking for Apple. He's no longer at Apple, but he's still a designer. It will facilitate and coordinate not only the activities of all the other computers and devices we use, but a wide array of devices to come. He says it's a digital hub. Well, I mean, that, that's that's so speculative. Um, but the, the the thing is about... I, I, I agree with that. When, when you see something in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal, usually, I, I don't. you don't know for a fact, but one of the things you put on your little whiteboard of possibilities is that this is a controlled leak for purposes to which we can't really guess as to why they're, uh, why the, such a leak would be made. But it, it is very much a content-free leak. When you read both these articles, there's very little you can really sink your teeth to. Right. I was going... I, I, of course, went through my archives and I wrote about an Apple Watch in 2011. I think it's still up on Mac World, Talking about, here's here's what they could do just as a design thing as a, as a cool thing to do but when we talk now now everybody's sort of letting their imaginations get away from them because they're talking about how apple will create a watch that will coordinate every single thing we do on every single one of our computers they have yet to produce another product that works that way they make a lot of devices that communicate with each other very effectively but they if they were to produce a watch that were to unify all of your devices into one experience that would be pretty much an unprecedented product for them to make they keep talking about things like uh, uh, OS services like notification center and Siri uh, of all things and those are both OS 10 services and we'll remember that uh, iOS and Mac OS are both different uh, builds build outs of OS 10 so if you're going to be using a really really muscular operating system that can do that you're going to need a real CPU for it you're going to need a real CPU for it now you're going to need new battery for it and that's how sensible sane men wind up with a watch design like this <laughs> so Homer Simpson's see, just, watch yeah exactly <laughs> so i'm uh, i'm not really sure that I I, I I i i like the idea of an apple watch i think that uh when i every time that i think that that's a really good rumor 
I always think about the opening lines in the keynote in which Tim Cook shows it off. And I can totally imagine him saying, we were all around our conference table at a meeting and suddenly we realized that none of us wear digital watches. We all wear analog watches. And we discovered the reason why we wear analog watches is because we don't, we've never been able to find a, a digital watch that's so good we would want to wear it every single day. So we made one and mm -hmm. then roll up a sleeve and ooh, ah, hold up for the camera. You can really, I can really see that sort of thing happening. What I don't see is we don't, we, we don't, uh, when we have a watch that is going to be sold to consumers, and remember that Apple is a consumer electronics company at this point, not a computer company. They have to make a product that really speaks to the average person who has everyday problems. And right now, nobody has described a problem where, I'm, 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 I have a problem where it's very difficult for me to reach into my pocket over here and pick up my phone and look at a notification. It's very, very difficult for me to look to the left of my salad plate at a restaurant where I've left my, 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 my phone uh, and check for a notification. You have to sort of train people to look at this expensive thing on their wrist for something that is not going to be able to tell them what the real problem, excuse me, it's, it's going to give them sort of a go or a no-go. Say, yes, you should look at your phone right now and here's the reason why. It's 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 not a, it's not something that makes an obvious compelling case. Apple could do if any company could make a, a compelling case for wrist wearable computing. I think they could do that. Remember, they did do that with the iPad. But I think that a lot of people are letting their imaginations get away from them to thinking that a device that is reasonable to wear on your wrist and practical to actually operate would do all of these sort of things, and that it would do them in such a way that you would three weeks later still be choosing to wear this expensive watch that whose battery dies once a week instead of the really nice watch that you bought for exactly $30 whose battery lasts for three years. I have to say, though, that, I mean, it's an easy target for, for journalists to just pluck out the air because obviously they're looking for the next big thing from Apple. And, you know, they, as I said, they, yeah. they did the Apple TV to death and now, ooh, a watch, you know, we haven't covered that. But I have to say, after using the, the Pebble for probably, you know, four or five days now, I, I can actually see a use case for it because, um, you know, it, it, it is an elegant device. It's not as thick and chunky as Andy's, but it's, you know, it's nice <laughs> and slim. It's, it's a permanently on display. It has this nice uh, paper display, if I hold it that way around. Um, fairly chunky buttons on it, but it does, you know, communicate with the iPhone seamlessly. Uh, once you set it up over Bluetooth, uh, if a message comes in, it displays on the, on the screen, you know, it will actually notify you there's a message. You can just look at your wrist rather than pulling your phone. Around. I mean, I never wear a watch. I always use my iPhone as my timepiece, but I have started to wear this now because it's, it, it is fairly convenient. Um, you know, you actually do see that you don't get just a notification that a message is in. You actually do see the message on the watch and you can scroll the message mm -hmm. using the watch as well. You, you can control the music on your iPhone as well. So, you know, although it's certainly not an Apple device, it, it certainly, you know, has, has the beginnings of something that I could, I could well imagine Apple, to, you know, going to town on and turning it into a, quite, a, quite a, a, a nice device that people would actually want to use with their iPad or with their iPhone, especially if we're going down the route of, you know, a smaller iPad that perhaps you you do carry about with you, but you don't want to always sort of take it out to just check on the time. Um, you know, you have your uh, Bluetooth enabled uh, iWatch. To kind of bridge between what Andy and Don was saying, there's there's really two classes of Apple products. And one is the iPhone and iPad, where so far Steve Jobs has stood up on stage and told you why the keyboards and styluses of old sucked and how Apple was going to re revolutionize it or the 10 things that the iPad would do better than your computer or your smartphone. But then there's the smaller class of devices like the hobby devices like the Apple TV, where all Apple wants to do is to increase the value of their ecosystem. And those aren't expected to sell in the hundreds of millions. They maybe sell in the single or double digit millions. And they don't have app platforms. They don't have all the same resources and uh, you know the same scope as a full on iOS device. But they do bring added value to owning all of those devices and makes it more likely that if you choose a device, you'll choose an Apple one because, hey, look, look at the awesome other stuff I can do with it. And I think so far, uh, the, the technology that we've seen, whether it's Siri or iMessage or anything else, makes an iWatch look more like an Apple TV-style companion device than a full-on iOS device. Mm -hmm. and, and we should point out that as uh, the Pebble watch is very limited in its capabilities because it's not made by Apple. Presumably, if Apple made a watch, it would have complete integration into the yeah. iPhone. Yeah, I mean, it, it would... It would 
it, it, there's both good news and bad news as I see it. The good news is that Notification Center is such a powerful resource. It's not just pop-ups. It's, it's not just, hey, look, they took this this the scroll down idea from Android. Hey, look, they took growl style notifications. No, I mean, it's, it's part of an infrastructure that goes all the way back to the very first iPhone where any app can communicate to any other device, no matter what uh, amount of networking exists between the originator and the recipient of that device. So what, what, what what's so encouraging about, uh, about this idea is that if all Apple had to do was to wire up this watch to notification center so that an app without even knowing that the target the ultimate target was a watch it could actually send notifications to that watch that would be a very compelling product on the other hand apple's exactly the sort of company that could screw up any product that requires <laughs> that requires like outside work and outside help Pebble, one of the things that was so uh, so encouraging about Pebble was the idea that we're going to come up with an API kit. We're going to pursue as many people as possible, want to develop as many great apps out there. We have our own ideas for how people will want to use that watch, but we know that our imagination is limited. We know that the imagination of the entire community is unlimited, and we want to tap into that power. You could sort of imagine Apple saying, and we've decided to create, and drum roll, everyone's thinking, everyone in the audience is thinking, oh, APIs, APIs strategic partnership with mm -hmm. limited numbers of highly selected content providers swatch like nike nike yeah. <laughs> nike yeah. yeah you know so it's so if, if it's a, if it's a 150 dollars thing that doesn't do very much that requires you to learn a brand new behavior that's a problem i don't i think people are out of the habit of wearing watches i don't i think this is a non-starter but i also thought the apple tv was a non-starter um it really feels to me like apple's uh throwing up trial balloons and saying well what if we made that uh, this does not inspire, to be honest with you. Uh, it's not an iPod Wi-Fi caliber, an iPod Hi-Fi caliber device. Right. <laughs> not even. It's, it's, not it's, even it's iPod not, socks. It's, it's not exactly. Is it? <laughs> I get, it's, but, uh, you, Nobody you wears watches. There's no watches in the front row of... Yesterday, I asked the Twit audience, or Sunday, I asked the Twit audience. No, one person was wearing a watch. People don't wear watches anymore. Yeah, me either. So the, I the, think the, once you get out of the habit of wearing a watch... It's pretty hard to get you to wear a watch again. Yeah. The, the other problem Wait a minute, is that Beatmaster is wearing a watch. <laughs> One person. Representing. Your battery died. <laughs> and he wishes he had his watch. All right. All right. So I take it back. And, 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 and Iaz wears a watch. Why do you wear a watch, Iaz? What are you, crazy? And John, It's a gift. And John, yeah, because I think this is jewelry more now than anything else. Yeah. Well, and I, it, John Salinas says, I don't have to take it out of my pocket to see what time it is. And I agree, that is a little bit of an annoyance when it comes to uh, using your phone. But you do have a timekeeper all the time. And I just suspect people don't want watches anymore. But maybe Mark, I'm wrong. You're forgetting the crucial point, though, Leo, that uh, Apple will tell you that you really do need a watch. Yeah. Well, how many times can Apple go to that well? No, well, you know, because because they they always say they don't they they don't go to focus groups. They don't research what people think they want. They they. Define a need. They de develop the engineering. They develop the product, and they. Sort of we know that's a know, lie, by the way. After the Apple good, Samsung uh, trial and the depositions, that in fact Apple does do focus groups. They do do research, and I think this trial balloon, and it's clearly coming from Apple, or it wouldn't be the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. This trial balloon is market research. They're watching mm -hmm. now. What do they think? Should we make this? I, I don't know. I think it's a dumb idea. Or they're just splashing around so people think that they're busy and stop bothering them while they work on their other <clears> stuff. <throat> oh, it could be. I liked your I liked your notion uh, that this is a way of reassuring the stock market that they're still innovating. I mean, it, it could very well be that. I mean, I imagine no. that there is some publicity, uh, you know, in full gear, know. some publicity department in full gear trying to trying to bring the stock price back up a little bit, maybe. That's a, that's like that's like telling your kid, you know, and your birthday is coming up in three weeks, and wait until you see the great surprise yeah. we're going to because yeah, always they'll, risky. They'll get, the, they'll get the kid to settle down. She'll she'll go to bed yeah. early. If she'll you're good, yeah. If and you're then, good, yeah. and then when she doesn't get the watch in three weeks, she gets <laughs> twice as angry as she would have been. Otherwise. It doesn't work. So. I've tried it. <laughs> it's a bad. It's no one watch, of those. But an extra color nano. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, I suppose we could spend some time thinking about what uh, this what would make this watch a good idea. I did not say the iPad was a dumb idea, Hawaii Dave. In fact, I loved the iPad and uh, and said this is the computer Apple was born to make. I don't think this is an iPad uh, quality idea. And I I poo pooed the TV too for a long time. So I mean, we'll see. I just I don't think I don't think this is an actual product. I do think there's a lot of interest in wearable computing from from a lot of companies, including Google and Apple. And uh, they're trying to figure it out. Yeah. But I don't think that this is a, to me, this is not a solution 
for a problem that exists. They're trying to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Nobody's demanding. You know, we need a better way to wear our phones. Is that a market? We need a better way to wear our computers. Yeah. Uh, if you could plug it into my brain, that might be something. I don't want to wear Google Glass either. <laughs> you know, yeah, we, we're Glass. testing wearable computing. There's a thread there. We're pulling at it. We have the watch. It's a hobby, but it's an area of intense interest. <laughs> and maybe yeah. we'll go to the glasses one day. Mm, I, <laughs> I think it make the Apple TV better. Yeah. Instead of all this. I, right right before the show, I, I filed a column about uh, about these rumors uh, to uh, the Sun-Times. It should be up, hopefully, by the, time, by the end of the show. Uh, and I ended by saying that I, I don't I don't believe we'll see an Apple Watch anytime soon. Of course, I could be very wrong, but I don't believe we'll see one anytime soon. But I, I ended by saying that what, what I would really love to see them do is something very, very simple. If they just simply, I, I would love to see Apple design go to nu go nuts on a simpler device that doesn't have about a thousand different variables with it. If all they had to do was, guys, we want you guys to design, and, and we want, we want the, this department to simply design a beautiful digital watch that everybody would want to put on their wrist. In terms of cool advanced features, put some sort of a dingus on there so that if there's a reason for me to look at my phone, it will simply, when I'm checking the time or when I feel a buzz, I know that, oh, I see that, I see that the, the cow is, has actually landed on the moon and is having tea. That means that that's just the watch's way of telling me, check your phone. There's something you wanted me to, to tell you about. But could you imagine a beautiful Apple design device that doesn't cost $200, $500, $1,000, $2,000, $2, a beautiful Apple design digital device that costs $100, $79, maybe even $50. That would be fantastic. A lot of people were very happy with a Nano as a watch. Yeah. But just make it an iPod. It's also hard to imagine what comes next. I mean, we before the iPhone, we had those renders of the iPod with a click wheel dialer. And, you know, it turned out to be something very different than that. So the idea of just a shrunken down screen with four icons on it is what we're imagining now. But it's, it's hard to tell what Apple would actually make as a go-to-market product. Mm. The chat, somebody in the chat room uh, said, what about something just uh, simple? It's, um, uh, this is from YYZ, $99, a simple watch, well-designed, shows notifications, that, you know, like a better pebble. Yeah. It's a small screen iPod. It's a revolutionary internet device. And it's a phone. <laughs> and your it's email. A small screen iPod. <laughs> so Are you yeah. getting it yet? <laughs> it tells you the time. It holds hey, a I'll piece of scotch tape when you're wrapping a package. And it rips the hairs out of your wrist. Are you getting it? It tells the time. It holds a strip of scotch tape when you're wrapping a package. It rips the hairs out of your wrist. This is one device. What if Siri were built into it? What if you said if you could talk to that? Well, I don't know why that's an improvement than talk than talking to your phone. But well, Siri is really well geared toward philosophically. I mean, because it is because you don't type. You can't type on a watch. Well, no, right? I'm not even talking about not typing. I'm talking about it's it's focused. On uh, the user is going to ask me a question. It might be a complex question. What I'm going to give them in response is the shortest, most effective thing I can say behind, uh, say back to it. That's better, better wear a jacket. It's 28 degrees outside today. Or look, mm. the bad the Red Sox beat the, beat the Marlins, uh, beat, beat the Marlins eight to seven. Uh, Snippets of information that are really very useful for a tiny, tiny little screen, whether it's whether it's speaking isn't, or not. Aren't, isn't Google Glass better to do all of the things that we're talking about than a wristwatch? No. It's, we, well, it's, we, it's want, we, we want to have it on your face all the time? Mm -hmm. Well, the advantage of face is that, that it's near my ears and it could talk to me. Because yeah, I kind of want again, it to talk to me. Again, would you want it on your face all the time? Would you want every your your, your main <laughs> point of user interface to every other thinking person in the world is they get to see you wearing these special glasses? Yeah, I mean, we we, we all wear glass we wear our glasses all the time. I, I know that's not a big deal, but I'm it, that's such a big hurdle for so many people to get over. We're asked checking your watch. You know, we, as a matter of fact, a friend of mine had the Pebble watch. It was the first time I actually had held one in my hand a week ago at dinner. And we were having a conversation about it, how you know, it's a nerdy table of about six to eight people who, you know, work in tech. So we don't have a, there's not a social faux pas involved in having a phone like out next to, on the table next to the plate. That's what everybody does. It's not, no, everybody. I go, you go to the restaurant, right. everybody has their phone on the table. Right. And we and we talk and we talk about like the social well, if you have it on, on the watch, you can actually check things less obtrusively. But wasn't there a time <laughs> when wristwatches first came on the scene where, you know, this is the rude thing where I'm having a conversation, but I need to make a train, yeah. but I'm going to look like this. Yeah, that's rude. Can, yeah. Can I do that without people thinking? Yeah. Again, what what is the big it's big step between I'm gonna look at my wrist like this versus I'm gonna simply take take out my phone and take a look at it? It's, it's another factor. The thing Sorry, Renee. Go ahead. 
Well, the thing I was going to say is about the phone and its size and, and sort of being permanently on your on your wrist and using it for something like Siri. I mean, at the moment with the iPhone, you know, um, if you use Siri on the iPhone or the iPad, it actually calls back to uh, the Apple central servers and there's a lot of processing power involved for it to return the results. I can see in the next couple of generations, you know, they'll probably move that down to the iPhone or the iPad so that the processing is done on that device. And then really you could envisage the watch just being a conduit to your, to your iOS device. So, you know, it would literally be uh, just a, a, a method to to capture the audio and transmit it to your iPhone or your iPad and back again, you know, the results. So um, although, you know, Siri really does take a lot of uh, computational processing power, um, the size of the device really, I don't think will matter because it will, it will really, you know, be uh, in, in constant communication with your iPhone or your iPad. And yeah. a lot of the heavy lifting will be done on your, you know, device that's actually in your pocket rather than your wrist. There's one other thing that I think if we look at the history of Apple, they have been relentless in mainstreaming and democratizing computer technology from the Apple II to the Mac to the iPad. Their one goal is to make computers more accessible and more usable to non-power users, to mainstream users. And there are people for whom even a smartphone or a tablet are still too much computer. So if an iWatch is bound to those things, then it's a peripheral like an Apple TV. It's something that takes your existing gadget and lets it do a few more things. But if Apple believes that there's a market for a highly stripped down, very specific device that will just let even more people have access to computing, then I think that is another interesting possibility mm. for them. Yeah, but does, does, does that really do that? I mean, if they were really committed to that, they would find a way to make a really beautiful $500 MacBook. They don't care about that. They make a $1,000 MacBook that's beautiful and elegant and probably better designed than most people need it to be. Uh, they could take a, a smaller margin if they really wanted to make devices more affordable to people. I mean, that's affordance. I, 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 I'm talking I, about interface. Uh, well, access, okay, accessible to people with money. You know, yes. most, most people have hard, have, have a harder problem with that. But the, the, the other thing that made me think about that, though, was that is the solution to I could again I'm also I, I, I play out the keynote in my head and it's, and I, I, I could imagine like Google coming out with a watch exactly like the one that's being rumored and then saying some people seem to think that the solution to the problem of complex notifications and our devices interrupting us all the time is to make the interruptions easier to see. Our solution is let's make sure our devices never call for our attention until we need it. We have an intelligent assistant that can handle your inbox, handle your flow, handle your notifications. I'll tell and you, you, get to wear whatever you want if on you, your wrist. If you ever use Google Now, you start to see that there is a there is a strategy with Google Now. It's coming at the same problem from a different angle. That's kind of interesting. And they have a huge advantage because Google owns that voice technology, where Apple is right. using it from nuance. nuance. And Apple doesn't yep. have the rights and the abilities yep. to do with it what Google can do with Google and Now. Google's yet. been collecting signals for a long time yeah we're gonna take a break uh enough with the watch <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about the mac pro somebody in the chat room said and i agree with him i hope this isn't taking energy away from apple's working on a new mac pro <laughs> i guarantee you it is <laughs> i can yeah, almost promise you that's Absolutely. exactly what it's doing <laughs> I think I think I think I think they're working 400 times as hard on the Mac Pro. Whatever num whatever numerical number you can put into the amount of effort they're putting in the next Pro, double it. Double it. A thousand it. times that. A thousand times. Hey, if you are putting any energy into a blog, into a company, into an invention, you probably know that there are uh it's a very good idea to protect it legally. You might be saying, "I can't afford a law firm. I've got an idea for you. Legal Zoom." Dot com. It's not a law firm. It gives you self-help services to get those legal documents and uh, legal uh, things done. This is how I did the LLC for Twit. And you know what? It's such a good LLC. Here we are eight years later, still using it. Worked great. For incorporation, for LLC, for trademark. Yes, you probably, OMG Chad is, uh, he's trademarking marking, uh, OMG Chad, right? Yeah, my username. You should. Yeah. Trademark. Anyone here, else uh, to take it. Your, your uh, IRC handle. Your Beatmasters put a lot of energy into cultivating the Beatmaster handle. You don't want anybody else to use that. It's less than you think. $99 to form an LLC. $69 for a, a will or a legal trust. Uh, in the past 12 years, over 2 million Americans have used LegalZoom for LLCs and wills and trusts and trademarks. It's a simple step-by-step -step questionnaire online. You walk through, they've got great customer support. And if you feel like at some point, God, I'd love to ask a, a lawyer one question. Good news. They have now an extensive network of attorneys. They call them LegalZoom's legal plans available in most states. 
You can search online profiles and unedited customer reviews to pick that attorney. And they've pre-negotiated pre low, low rates. So if you just, I just want to ask one question. You can get great legal advice as well. I think LegalZoom is fantastic. As I said, uh, even for, the, for this company, <laughs> this was the solution. And I think you should think about this. Get help from an attorney, but do as much as you can by yourself as well, as well affordable, personalized documents, wills, LLC, trademark. I want you to visit LegalZoom.com. Uh, and let them know you heard about it on MacBreak Weekly. When they ask you for an offer code, use MBW. And as our thanks to you, we'll give you 10 bucks back. Uh, you know, I know it's not a huge amount, but it's but it's just a way of saying thank you for saying MBW. That way they'll know where you heard about. LegalZoom.com. If you're starting a business, trust me, this is the thing to do. To do. LegalZoom.com. You're watching Mac Break Weekly with Andy Anatko from the Chicago Sun-Times. Screencasts online's Don McAllister. And from iMore.com, Renee Ritchie. What a great... I love the panel on this show. You're, you're not going to get a better group of uh, experts on what's going on in Apple. Speaking of which, we talked about this on Twit. And, you know, while we are generalists on Twit, I'd like to get a the Mac-centric panel to respond to this notion that the Mac Pro is coming. There's two, two data points on this. One, as we mentioned last week, they, Apple's not going to be able to sell its Mac Pro in Europe starting March 1st because of some minor regulatory changes. It means that, for instance, the fan needs a cover. And instead of putting a cover on the fan, Apple says, yeah, we're not going to sell that Mac Pro anymore. Some say that means they've got a new one coming. Otherwise, why would they give that up? Others might say, well, maybe because it's such a small part of their business, they don't care. Uh, and then uh, th there is a, a reseller, France Systeme, who says uh, Apple will have a Mac Pro replacement ready to ship uh, within months. Now, we don't know if this comes from Tim Cook's statement last year that Mac Pro users, he said, Apple has something really great for you Mac Pro users. <laughs> he didn't say it has a Mac Pro. So uh, these rumors are floating again. Uh, let's go to imore.com. That's the rumor central. Renee Ritchie, what do we what do we think? Mac Pro on its way this spring. Uh, the thing about these rumors is when you start chasing them down uh, a lot is that they have interesting origins. It's it's highly unlikely that anybody outside of Apple and their direct <sighs> manufacturing partners have anything substantive uh, about yeah. timelines or product releases. But a lot of times, what happens is someone will go, to, you know, whether they're a manufacturer, an accessory maker, a peripheral maker, whether they have an Apple certified reseller or store, they'll go talk to a friend and they'll say, Yeah, I've heard this thing. And sometimes, you know, they read it on a blog and they told it to somebody. And then that person goes and tells right. someone else. Then they tell a blog. Then it becomes, and suddenly, you know, gospel. Yeah, absolutely. So 90% of the time when you see these stories, it's just based on broken telephone. It's someone's right. wishful thinking or someone read something. And over the course of two or three people, it becomes Apple has told me that <laughs> this thing is going to be released. They're certainly due for a refresh. The Radeon 5770, the uh, the uh, older uh, Intel chipset. I mean, it seems as if if you're a Mac, you know, a, a Mac user... <laughs> No Thunderbolt, no. I mean, no there's, Thunderbolt there's so is a yeah. huge, um, you know, missing piece. I can't even use my Thunderbolt cinema display with with the Mac Pro. No USB three. No USB yeah. three. That would come with a new chipset. Are they? Is there a new Intel chipset they're waiting on? Is uh, is there something? There's going? always a new Intel chipset. Well, that's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, currently, yeah, the the, the high end stuff. the high end uh, Mac Pro is a is twelve cores. With 12 gigs of RAM, two 2.4 gigahertz six-core Intel Xeon processors. I mean, it's it's a beast. It's expensive beast. Yeah. I want, let me just let me just order one and see. It says in, <laughs> well, I'm just curious. It says in stock. If you stock. order one, Leo, the new one gets announced tomorrow. Next you know business that. day <laughs> shipping available. It is in stock. I can uh, bump it up to a 3.06 gigahertz 12 cores for six thousand dollars. Let's uh, how much RAM can I put in? 64 gigs of RAM. That only adds two grand. Now I'm up to eight thousand dollars. Let's put in. Uh, Leo, maybe you should have like a spotter next to you. To sure you <laughs> <get the> <laughs> it might fall off. <laughs> I want to put in an SSD for. It doesn't have, which is too bad. That uh, great Fusion drive that I have yeah. in the new iMac would be nice to have in this. Not as not a choice. 
But I can put, let's see, there's four drive bays, so I could put eight terabytes and an SSD drive. You can get an optical drive still, Leo. Ooh, look. Optical drive. Should I get two super drives just for the heck of it? Since I can? Why would you, you want two on your iMac, might as well. <laughs> Why would you want two super drives? And, uh, oh, now I can get a 5870. It's a little bit better. See, the thing with the Mac Pro, though, it used to be sold on two accounts, didn't it? One was the fact that it was expandable, and one was the raw performance. And, you know, performance, yeah, you know, we could still do with these high-performance machines, but expandability is probably a bit moot now because we've got expansion via Thunderbolt. So, you know, I, I can't see them really creating a similar beast to the Mac Pro. I think it will be a very different uh, machine if and when it ever does arrive because I, I think they're going to rely on the, the Thunderbolt Plus and the USB 3 to offer the expandability for people. And to just concentrate on the pure performance and, you know, extra memory and stuff. It's the Apple cheese grater, they call it, because of the uh, mm -hmm. the holes on the side. I still got my Mac Pro. I look at it lovingly from time to time. It's not that fast anymore. No. Your new iMac is probably runs circles around it now. Yeah. The new iMac with the Fusion Drive is notably fast. In fact, I'm going to review it on Before You Buy uh, later today. But it's like, mm -hmm. a, it's like a MacBook Air now. It's all hermetically sealed. You know, you can't get to it. As right. Less, it's, it's. I can add memory, I think. Now, the trucks are becoming SUVs. YYZ is saying, and I think he's right, uh, the Fusion capability is built into the OS. Can I not kind of just say, designate a SSD drive and a, and a, solid, and a spinning drive and say, Fusion those? I think there are some hacks you yeah. can do, some terrible... Oh, you have uh, to hack it. You can't... Yeah, yeah, there is a hack. It's not fully supported unless it's installed at the factory. It's not built into a disk utility or something. No, if you have a different version of disk utility on a machine with a Fusion drive, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a Mac Mini, which has uh, got a Fusion drive, and um, I have to say, it's very, I'm very impressed. I actually bought it because I, I've got my, um, I moved from the Mac Pro to my uh, Retina MacBook Pro, and I use that as my main production machine. Interesting. And, uh, yeah, and I, it, it's, it's actually faster. I mean, it, fair enough, it was a 2008 Mac Pro, so, you know, it's a bit long in the tooth. Right. But um, it is actually faster in, in all respects to, to the original Mac Pro that I had. But I needed, uh, I needed to go into the shop for uh, some work on the screen, and uh, I had no sort of equivalent machine. So I got a Mac Mini with a Fusion drive and 16-gig uh, of RAM and uh, the, the i7 processor. And that's nearly as fast as the, the rest of the MacBook Pro. It's just incredible the performance we're getting out of these. It's, it's, it's I, I said my same uh, exact reaction. I did... Uh, you know, Blackmagic has a disk speed test available on the App Store. That's what I use. I, I presume that it's competent. Uh, and, um, in fact, here's the results. The, the uh, results on the right are uh, from the other world computing SSD that I put into my MacBook Pro Retina. So that's about as fast as you can get. Pure SSD, 308 megabytes write, 504 megabytes read. I'm very close to that with the Fusion Drive, and I've got three terabytes. 286, and it gets faster, by the way. As you run the test, the Fusion Drive says, ah, this is a file you want, and moves it over to the solid-state drive. Uh, 286 megabytes per second write and 383 megabytes per second read. It's pretty darn good. Pretty darn good. Um, I agree with you. I like the Fusion Drive, and you don't have that limited uh, capacity that you have with a, or, or I presume cost, I don't know, with the SSD. So I, I like the Fusion Drive. I think that's mm -hmm. brilliant. And yes, it, there there are ways to do that. YYZ is pointing to uh, another world computing link. And I guess you use the command line to uh, create your own Fusion Drive. Macworld has also a, uh, a link to that. Now, is, is, there, is there anything left nowadays where uh, a, a Tower Mac is really a deal breaker, where if you don't have a Tower Mac available, you just can't do the sort of work you want to do? You, the usual explanation that I keep getting is that I just need lots and lots of peripheral bays for how I need to outfit, outfit this. Uh, some, sometimes I ask for, I, I want, I, I really wish there were a 128 core processor uh, version of that I could outfit. But I, I, I have to sort of confront the fact that as disappointed as I am, that there's no really big, huge, impressive Stonehenge-like Tower Mac that so many of the devices that are out there already are really in the class of anything we would have been happy with about a year, year and a half ago. The only but reason I, I, can, I don't do the sort of work that the people need a tower for, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah at Twit, the only reason we need a, a tower is because we use a fiber network, and we have to have, put a SAN card in there, right? And that's not unusual in video production. There are a variety of, say, Black Magic cards that you might want to put in there, capture cards, and so forth. You do need card slots for some of these specialized applications, audio production, I believe, also. 
there are cases where you'd want to put some specialized uh, cards in there. We are, we are seeing going some sort of dedicated enclosures now, so that if you want to Thunderbolt. attach, uh, yeah, Thunderbolt, yeah. it's actually you, you can get them for uh, all sorts of cards now, where it's a, a, a dedicated external enclosure that you just slot in, and um, you, know, you don't need that internal card anymore. I suppose we could do that. Now, is, is that a, a box that gives you the card slots, or is that the same functionality in the form of a Thunderbolt box? No, it's a box that gives you the card slots. Yeah, I've seen a couple of those. Oh, okay, open there you go. Uh, okay. OTC. And Thunderbolt, is that as fast as the IO, IO bus on a Mac Pro? I'm I think it's fast-ish uh, enough. Pretty fast close, enough. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> close to as fast. I think it's not as fast as the bus. I don't know. Interesting thing, I got one of these new Drobo 5Ds um, arrived today, and I whacked... Um, I think I've put 12 terabytes of, uh, of drives in there and it connects via Thunderbolt. It's got a little SSD card in there as well. And it's, it's just unbelievably fast. It's I love USB. My SSD and it's, you know, it's, it's 12 terabytes of data hanging straight off my, my laptop that's yeah. as fast as the, uh, nearly as fast as the local hard drive. It's just incredible. So uh, USB 3 is 5 gigabits per second. Thunderbolt has dual channel 10 gigabits per second. Um, that's 10 gigabits is as fast as uh, the six gigabit uh, uh, SATA connection. So I think it's I think that is in theory as fast if you get that native two-way 10 gigabits. Yeah, interestingly at the at MacWorld, I think it was Corning Glass. They've uh, they're just about to launch some optical cables for both Thunderbolt and also for USB three, um, and they they don't improve the speed. It's still 10 gigabits both ways, but on the uh, Thunderbolt cables, you can run up to 100, I think it's 100 meters of, wow. uh, of connection at 10 gigabit speed and also interconnect various devices as well. So you can have just a little box on your desk and uh, everything else in a server room, you know, 100 meters away and you've, you've still got Thunderbolt speeds to those external devices. And in a theoretical world where Apple one day has a Retina Thunderbolt display, they'll need double uh, Thunderbolt to move that many pixels. So we'll get twice what we have now. So I mean, increasingly, that looks to be the future. Soon, says Apple, you'll be able to connect a host of Thunderbolt-enabled devices <laughs> <laughs> any day now. It's a beautiful dream. <laughs> there are video capture solutions uh, from AJA and Blackmagic and Matrox. Uh, there is a SAN fiber uh, link uh, adapter from Promise, fiber channel adapter from Promise. So presumably we could do that. Um, Sonnet. Eh, you know, PCI Express chassis. I guess there's, I guess there's, yeah, I guess you could solve this. So that Apple would probably is, in fact, is pointing to this stuff. And I think that they would probably say to anybody who says, well, I need the expansion capability of a Mac Pro. Well, look, all you need is a, uh, an iMac with Thunderbolt. I just, use my Mac Pro as a 2009 Mac Pro just to do Skype for this show now. Everything else I'm doing on my Retina MacBook Pro because it's so fast and convenient. Right. Yeah, I like my I mean, Mac, right, Retina. Yeah. The only thing with the iMac that my professionals might be put off by is the actual, although it's a beautiful display, you know, they might want to use their own custom display or... or well, you could still do that. Yeah, true. But then you're paying the extra. I mean, people always perceive you're paying the extra for the display and if you don't really want it, you know, it's, right. it's a bit of extra expense. So, you know, an Mini. iMac in a small box, Mac Mini. Is the Mac Mini as fast as the iMac, though? Uh, I don't know about the iMac. It's certainly, it's, as I mentioned before, it's certainly as, as fast as my uh, Retina MacBook Pro. It's but still again, laptop uh, parts where based the on iMac laptops. is. Yeah. It's a laptop yeah. part. Yeah. The iMac has desktop parts. Yeah. Uh, and the, I, the iMac fastest processor, they don't put Xeons in there. Those are all uh, mm -hmm. i5s, i7s, right? So, I mean, that's the advantage of the Mac Pro still is that you're getting server-grade parts. You're getting server, server chips and yeah. server-grade hard drives and yeah. giant fans. I just know, I, I think pros are still going to eschew the idea of using an iMac instead of a Mac Pro. I think, you know, Don had a good point. I mean, in the future, you could see a, a Mac Pro without as many maybe optical drives, thinner, not, you know, maybe a, an iMac makeover for a Mac Pro, whatever that version is. Whatever That the, would be a good like, solution. Just say, look, you've got to recondition people. Say, no, you, you know, you keep thinking you have to put stuff in a case all at once. That's actually not a good idea. Why don't you have the CPU and is is one unit, and the other two things are units, and then you can combine. Them. Maybe if they made them stackable, so you could like, maybe that's what they're going to do. That would be a good. Don't you think that'd be a good marketing um, plan? Make a server make grade units. Mac Mini. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and have it stackable, so you could say, okay, now you have the Thunderbolt stacking solution on top of that, and it, you could actually build a Mac Pro. It's still a truck, <laughs> but it's not an eighteen wheeler anymore. Right. I think that would be a very interesting uh, way of recontextualizing it. 
I don't know if an onboard bus... Da Vinci Wonder says the onboard bus is the advantage in our chat room. I don't know if you need an onboard bus. Do you? Can you not... Could, could, could you not say the Thunderbolt is the bus, the IO bus, and is this fast? It would be interesting if you could actually hook up a number of, you know, processor units via Thunderbolt. I mean, I don't know even if technically that's possible, but, you know, to actually, you know, as many processors as you want, just stack them up and connect them via yeah. Thunderbolt. Yeah. Well, there's that external GPU market that they keep talking about. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd, I bet you that's what happens, because I don't think that the iMac is a solution for pros, because for the for the reasons we've we've mentioned. Mm -hmm. Well, also if you want to stack them in a closet, they're not very space efficient. Right. I like the idea of a kind of a modular. Oh, somebody's already thought this up at fcp.co finalcutpro.co. What the new Mac Pro could look like. Peter Zigich proposes a modular design, exactly as I was just mentioning uh, although it's kind of ends up looking exactly like the cheese grater <laughs> <laughs> but that's what i'm kind of thinking is what you know and then and then it's even more flexible what do you need want to want to make it a faster processor swap out the processor module how about that but the, it all it all is contingent on the thunderbolt bus being sufficient i wish uh, if next time alex Lindsay's here we'll ask him he buys mac minis doesn't he he buys a lot of Mac Mini. He buys everything. Yeah, he buys everything. <laughs> That's not a test of anything, is it? <laughs> uh, let's take a break. Come back with some Apple tidbits in just a little bit. And we'll also talk about uh, the lawsuit, the silly, silly lawsuit, and uh, more. We're talking about Macintosh and iOS. We've all, it's, been, it's been great. It's been a Mac conversation. Let's talk right now about Squarespace.com. I was just watching a Twitter conversation. Who was it? Who was it? it was somebody I know. Uh, they were asking him, what's the best hosting solution? Squarespace. Very simple. Squarespace is hosting plus the best software on top of it. There's a real advantage to, to coupling the two. First of all, the software, the content management system is always kept up to date. But also, this, and this is something less obvious, but the server is more efficient too because it knows what software is running on it. It's one of the reasons you cannot bog down a Squarespace site. It's very clever. The, the serving technology that they're using on Squarespace basically uh, throws more power at your site whenever necessary. Which is one of the reasons when the, the, that I think this unlimited Squarespace uh, plan is such a good deal. $16 a month when you buy an annual plan. You get unlimited pages, unlimited galleries, unlimited blogs, but you also get unlimited bandwidth and unlimited storage and unlimited contributors. So that means you can make a massive site and not worry about, you know, getting slash dotted or twitted. We bring down sites routinely, but not Squarespace sites. Never have been able to bring a Squarespace site down. Go to our blog, Inside uh, Twit, inside.twit.tv. Can't bring it down. A, th a million people could visit it. Very, very cool. And Squarespace sites always look great because, of course, they have the best content management system. Go to squarespace.com, click the Get Started button. You can try it free for two weeks. You select a design. They say more than just a template, and I think this is apt. You select a design to start with, but then you completely customize it through point and click. Although, if you're a developer, you have full access to the JavaScript, the CSS. It's an HTML5 compliant. It's mobile responsive, too, which is great. If you're a photographer or a designer and you want a portfolio and you want that portfolio to look the same and work the same no matter what size screen... This is such a good solution. It resizes itself. In fact, when you upload images to your Squarespace site, you're going to, uh, it's actually going to resize the images in, I think, seven different formats. Here's a Qbert. I like this one. It kind of looks a little Pinteresty, but that's just the beginning, right? Now you, res you, you completely control this. And the beauty of it is it, it, it's true CSS. So your content is completely independent of the design. You decide you want to try a different design, no problem. Boom. You don't have to re-enter any content. Uh, you can import and export from all the existing uh, templates, Blogger, WordPress, uh, all the existing uh, APIs, which means you're never trapped because you can always exit a Squarespace site as easily as you got into it. In fact, it's worth doing the, uh, the two-week trial because... Uh, what will happen is uh, you can import your existing site. All the links are preserved. All the SEO is preserved. And uh, and you can really see what it's going to look like very quickly within the first day. Try it for two weeks. And then if you decide you want to keep it, 
you can finish the import. All the SEOs preserve all the links. And if you do register a, uh, for the one-year plan, they'll even do the domain name and the hookup and all that for you. It is a really great deal. I do invite you to use the offer code MACBREAK2 if you decide to buy because you'll save 10% on your first purchase. Again, another reason to do the full year. Squarespace.com. Try it out. If you decide to uh, buy, use the MACBREAK2, two for the month of February. Um, each of our offer codes is changed every month. So Mac break two for this month and you'll save 10% off your first purchase. Really great stuff. From really talented designers and technologists. Squarespace.com. Give it a try uh, today. 25 billion. That's the number of songs sold on the iTunes store. 25 billion. They released billion. a... That's with a B. Eddie Q says that uh, Apple averages 15,000 songs a minute downloaded. The iTunes store now has, this is kind of an amazing number, 26 million songs. That's the biggest number I've ever heard. I didn't even know there were that many songs. <laughs> In 119 uh, countries. And uh, Philip Lupke from Germany downloaded the 25 billionth song and received a 10,000 euro gift card. That's a lot of euros. <laughs> uh, his, the 10, 25 billionth song was Chase Book's Goxel Vansen remix of Monkey Drums. That's where you get 26 million songs, <laughs> right there. At least it wasn't something embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear it now. Wait minute, let me go. Uh, Eddie Q says, we're grateful to our users. Here it is. Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. By the way, Merlin Mann's yellow submarine iPod, still missing. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Wow. Monkey drums. Uh, this is it. The, the Goxel Vanson remix of Chase Book's Monkey Drums. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, the 25 billionth song. Should we stand? Yeah, let's stand. Put your hand over your heart. Are you hearing anything? No, is it playing? Nope. Nope. It's a very quiet song. Very quiet. I don't know if it's playing. A lot of people downloading it. Maybe hoping, I don't know, some of the magic will run off. It was rub Why, off. it's the most beautiful song ever recorded. <laughs> was... Only a fool can't hear it. <laughs> or everyone from Twitter is rushing to download it. it and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> the orchestration. You don't believe that the strings are a mite bit heavy. No, Especially Andrew. Especially the way it comes crashing in with a kettle drum. <laughs> I feel it's a full sonic palette. What, uh, is it me? I, know, I, I don't niche. know. Here, here uh, I'll just play you it. You play it. Monkey drum. Monkey drum. I can drums. never defeat the boss at Monkey the end of this level. <laughs> it <laughs> sounds like that, doesn't it? Flaming poop, poop. Pool. Sounds like Nintendo. We have a whole minute and 30 second uh, preview of this song. <laughs> you know, you could song? loop it and get the whole thing. <laughs> wow, that's worth 10,000 euros. This is fantastic. <laughs> Not embarrassing at all. <laughs> it's like one of those Saturday Night Live segments. I'll just leave this playing in the background. It, it, uh, what? Oh, here comes the drop. No, it's wrong. <laughs> we have monks singing in the background now. Wunderbar. I don't know if that's the yes. Goxel Vanson edition. Yes, yeah, just, let's just listen to the original monkey drums. Maybe, maybe I the original mean. monkey drums it sounds different. Why don't you? It's yeah. right above that. The Can original. That? Here's the original monkey drums. <laughs> Pretty similar. Now is the time on Mac Break Weekly where we dance. <laughs> Hear me now, believe me later. It's fantastic. Would it you was... like to touch my monkey drums? It was so good it required a remix. I'm getting Donkey Kong Country flashbacks. I see where he was going with this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely nowhere. <laughs> it's a trap. All right, enough. 25 billion song, ladies and gentlemen.
There are now you know why they're 26 million songs. <laughs> that one tune has eight variations. Oh, also, the, the, the upside is that with 25 million songs, that reduces your risk of accidentally encountering that one. <laughs> <laughs> Go listen to the 25 million 999 thousand 999 other songs. Uh, Tim Cook will be sitting time. with the First Lady during the uh, State of the Union tonight. Did you hear him this morning, Leo? He was on uh, the that, that Goldman Sachs call this morning for about an hour. Ah, tell us about it. What did he say? It was very similar. He had the exact same talking points as an Apple conference call, but he, he had some interesting <laughs> things too. Like That's he said, innovative. well, you know what? He's always going to sit. He's always going to stick to talking points. He's a profile. He's a high profile CEO of a high profile company. So he's not mad living up there. Uh, but he did say, you know, Johnny Ive is now in charge of all of software and he's the best designer in the world. And he's ecstatic to see what he's going to do with Apple software. And he said, you know, Apple can't make, <laughs> Apple couldn't figure out how to make a good netbook. So they made the iPad instead. And he gave his usual um, talk about where he sees the tablet market as becoming the PC market, where tablets are just going to increase in their share. And that with cheap products, uh, they, kept, they keep asking him the same questions, cheap iPhone, big iPhone. He just said, you know, when you look at what Apple's done historically, they've made old iPhones cheaper. They made an iPad mini. They made an iPod shuffle. That it's not impossible to see them doing that. Uh, well, they'll, they'll have a strategy in place for the iPhone going forward. So it was, it, was a, it was the same stuff he always says, but it was good to hear it all in one place with, uh, you know, better questions than average being asked. And he did say that Apple stores are like Prozac for him. Whenever he's depressed, he just goes to an <laughs> Apple store. Overprescribed to small children. I agree. <laughs> I agree too. Yeah, I, I, wish, I, I hope that someone like gets to Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Obama uh, <laughs> and, and, and simply says that if you could just like take anything you have around the house that's kind of clear plastic and weird and just sort of wear it on your wrist, it would really <laughs> freak everybody the hell out. And I think it would be yes. really funny. Just keep looking at it for no reason and just... She could troll the internet. <laughs> yeah, just keep tapping it. Yeah. And look at look at Tim and knowingly every once in a while. Usually, don't they uh, usually like... Uh, well, Lorene uh, sat with... Uh, Lorene Powell Jobs sat with uh, Michelle Obama last year. Steve's widow. He got, the, he got name checked in the, in, the, in the address, I think. Yeah. So usually if you're sitting there, they're going to say something. Like Tim Cook, poor guy, he was in Alabama at Auburn and he had nothing going for him. And then thanks to the jobs program, now he's the CEO of Apple. Something like that. <laughs> Only in America. Only in America. Uh, also, Bobak Ferdowski will be there. You know who that is? Nope. You ought to. Mohawk guy from the uh, oh from the Mars yeah, from Curiosity the landing at yep. JPL. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel I feel so sorry for that for that man's mother. It was, it was only because like she got when I had a ponytail, my mom never let me let me let me stop left giving to people. Oh, but you should really cut your hair. Oh, but you look so good without it. And now he has to he can say his mom. I got to meet the president and sit yeah. the state of the union because of this mohawk. Because of the mohawk, never, never ever say anything bad about yeah. this mohawk ever again. Thing is, though, is he going to have to wear that till he's eighty now because he's the mohawk. <laughs> he is the mohawk guy. That's it, like Mr. T. Oh, guy, it still be his thing. Uh, also, yeah. a startup from San Francisco, Council CEO and co-founder Ramji uh, Srinivasan will be there. Uh, Council is for parents planning to start a family. It can identify more than a hundred recessive genetic conditions that result in birth defects, chronic disease, intellectual disabilities, and early mortality. Do they really want to highlight that? What is the, uh, what, so you have, so now you've got this test. Now you know, what are you going to do? That, right? I don't know if that's, it's an odd thing to support. But I guess it's, again, we started this company. He says, uh, <laughs> Ramji says, we started this company out of a dorm room not long ago, drinking Red Bull. To be invited is quite an honor. <laughs> Maybe it's an Red ad for Red Bull to White House. Uh, Red Bull to okay. White House. Anyway, I just thought a little heads up. Look for Tim. Don't be. I just didn't want people to be shocked when they looked and they saw Tim Cook sitting there. <sighs> it's an opportunity to see if uh, if he has adopted an official costume <laughs> because he wears this. I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm here. If he, if he decides I'm at the State of the Union, I'm going to wear a jacket, I'm going to wear a tie, I'm going to dress up, versus if he wears the same sort of thing he usually wears to the keynotes, that will be a data point. Will you be shocked if the president holds up his wrist and says, I'm wearing the new iWatch? 
<laughs> no, I'll, I'll be pleased if he interrupts and say, Tim, ever since I updated to, to the new update, my battery life is like nothing. Like, I, I, yeah, I got GPS turned off. As a BlackBerry I, I, user, I, I would I'd like to thank Apple for fixing my 3G issues on the iPhone 4S. I wasn't able you're not to play Candy Crunch. Come on, man. It's been two years. All right. We get, need a new version of Pages. Get ready. According to reports from OLED-A.org, Apple has hired OLED television expert James Lee from LG's R&D team. He's working on AMOLED TVs. Which Tim Cook trashed today on the conference call. He did, call. yeah. 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 He said what? they were oversaturated in poor technology. And then he had this other thing where he said, Apple usually acquires talent, but we don't put them in the same role. PA Semi was a power PC company, but we've pivoted them to work on ARM architecture for our phones. Well, wait a minute. If, so this guy's an expert on AMOLED TVs, but we're going to have him work on LCDs instead? I, I, yeah, it, it doesn't sound like OLED is something that Apple's that interested in. Or disinformation. Perhaps. They are oversaturated. I mean, they, there is a lot of problems. That's Even so weird that he picked OLED to, 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 he picked that out in the call, in the call just to say it. It's weird. Well, he, he was talking about in general, he said that he, Apple's focused on the aha moment. When you open up a product and you say aha every day, when you use it over and over again, and it always excites you. And that's seldom the product of specs or pricing. And as part of that discussion, he said that some companies who don't nail a user experience try to compete using specs. <clears throat> Or pricing, and then he singled out OLED as one of those things. I got to tell that. you, having looked at the H, the Ultra HD OLED displays at CES this year, they're spectacular. They're spectacular. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 that's that's an interesting variable. Uh, just just like how the Beats by Dre headphones have terrible, terrible oversaturated bass, but people like oversaturated well, bass, especially with the kind of music they listen to. You can set a, 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 So here's the. You're right. And, and, of course, if you go look at, at, at any television in a showroom, you'll see it's oversaturated. They said it's a dynamic mode because it looks best in the showroom, and people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, our uh, uh, home theater guy, Scott Wilkinson, specifically asked uh, the companies, can you set this to a more natural? And they did, and it looked great. So I think ju judging it by what you saw at CES, th the point being that the blacks are very, they're, they're perfect black, and that the response time is virtually zero. Uh, these are very impressive. The only question in my mind about OLED, and I think I think Tim Cook's completely wrong. The only question in my mind about OLED is uh, is how long they'll last. There's still some question about the the dyes or wearing out. Or he's just saying that they'll, no one wants video on their iPod, Leo. You know, yeah. it could be disinformation. I don't understand why he would single it out. Besides the fact that he's completely wrong, I don't know why he would single it out. It's I mean, not what Apple's using. Yeah, I guess not. So maybe they don't want anybody to think that's what they're using on the but TV I did that ask, doesn't exist. I, did, I don't like to look at things in a vacuum. So I asked Phil Nickinson, who runs Android Central, our Android site, and he has tons of OLED screens, and he doesn't like them as much either. And he he finds them oversaturated and not as good as... They're oversaturated. Like the I, I agree they're oversaturated yeah. on, on phones. These are small screens. These are not TV screens. I don't think that that's... I think that's completely wrong, and I think you're going to be surprised, and I think you're, everybody's going to want OLED TVs. They will be the TV of choice in the next couple of years, as soon as the prices come down. That's just wrong. Uh, you can't, and you can't compare what you're getting on a Samsung phone to what you would see on a 55-inch television. Although yeah. Apple's probably lo talking about them from a phone perspective. At this Maybe point. that's it. Maybe is, was, so, so he didn't say was, TVs. He just said OLEDs. He doesn't like OLEDs. Yeah, he talks was, about was, the technology. Yeah, he didn't say TVs. Specifically okay. about the phone, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was in a hunk about uh, phone design and larger screens and that sort of stuff. Oh, all it? right. Okay, so maybe he's saying for their screens. Well, they're not going to do OLEDs. They're going to continue with IPS screens, right? So yeah. obviously OLED would be terrible until <laughs> until they do Bad it. Add OLED. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and plus, I think we, we, we tend to like put too much emphasis on what he says. He's not, I don't think he's... It's a, it, for a guy in his position, it's very easy for him to state an opinion and a, a, and a perspective that fits very well for their own goals. And for someone to think, oh, uh, read that and think, oh, well, he's slamming all phones that have this other display technology, when actually he's just saying, no, we, we have the reasons why we make the iPhone the way we do. Oh, well, that is not the technology that will help us achieve our goals. We and that's why like we don't it. use them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually, I, I, I use almost exclusively OLED phones. I like them. But a phone, you're not trying to do naturalistic color on a phone as you are on TV. It's very difficult, different. Uh, I think yeah. they look fantastic. And and by the way, all the Samsung phones have settings that you can make them more, nat you can mute the uh, saturation. Huh. 
I just it's a strange thing to say. Strange thing to be on somebody else's uh, analyst call for that matter. <laughs> Apple says it's paid eight billion dollars out to developers. That's one billion more than last month. They announced those numbers January seventh. Now in February, it's a billion dollars. So are they? Does that mean they're paying a billion dollars a month? Or it's ramping up, obviously, right? It was back in October they announced six and a half billion it paid out to developers. Then uh, January seventh, they announced eight billion it paid to developers, and now. I'm sorry. They had announced seven billion developers and now eight billion dollars. That's amazing. How, how much of that was Leo Simpson's money? <laughs> in app purchases. Yeah. Those in app purchases add up on that Simpsons game. I can tell you donuts are not cheap. Or candy yeah, crunch too. A lot of people are getting bitten on candy crunch in apps. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting when you break them down. I mean, it, it's, it sounds really, really great, and it is. But when you look at the distribution of that money, it's not as though it's being distributed equally. It's the top amongst, 10%. Um, oh, yeah, amongst many categories of apps. If you're, if you're a game developer, you're going to get that money. If you're, making, if you're one of a very small handful of game developers, you're definitely going to be making that money. If you're trying to get in there with a really good productivity app, something that really does support this statement that in the future people are not going to have uh, regular computers, they're going to have tablets. Uh, that doesn't really, st the, 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 the kind of apps that people are paying for that really doesn't support that. It also sort of colors uh, interpretation of the characteristic of people who use uh, apps on other platforms where uh, if it means that this platform is is more popular for apps, that's one thing. If it means that the iPhone and the iOS devices are more popular as gaming devices, that kind of colors uh, the attitude on on what the what the revenue generation is. We all know that uh, Android pe people who own Android devices tend to spend less money uh, in in, a in app purchases than uh, than iOS uh, people who just absolutely just shoveling money into their into their their, their feeds uh, day after day after day. I would, love to, I would love to see a real breakdown that lets us understand what kind of user is spending money, what kind of user is getting the free content, what kind of user is paying money to be productive with their device as opposed to uh, what they're going to be spending to actually just be entertained by it. Because we we all believe that uh, these little tablets are great devices for productivity. I use mine you know, every time I'm writing outside the office. But it really only becomes a revolution if you're using it for things other than, you know, making making firing birds of pigs and slicing fruit or building a fabulously lovely springfield <laughs> well i mean there was a controversy well not controversy but this week they announced that it looks like real racing 3 which is one of the most successful franchises in ios history probably the most successful racing game is going to be free to play and then have in-app purchases so that you can mm -hmm. get your cars back on the track faster mm -hmm. and power them yeah. uh longer and that's the model that companies like Zynga, I mean, we've proven over and over again that people will not pay $2 for a great game, but they will Isn't take a silly? free game and spend $99 on yeah. Smurf berries so their hut looks better than the hut of the yeah. kid next. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. It's a little psychology. upsetting, actually. I mean, have you ever, have you ever read about how uh, casino electronic games are made? They really are made to manipulate brain chemistry right. to just keep you there, pushing, you know, pulling the, pushing the button, pushing the button, feeding more money in, feeding more money in, and not, not just as a, even as an intellectual thing where you're thinking, oh, well, if I increase my bet, I'll make more money. No, it's about chemicals in your brain and how you can trigger uh, happy chemicals and how you basically. Uh, trick people, lull people into uh, a real fugue state that makes them stop thinking really critically about what they're doing and just do what they have to do to keep this flow going. Is it the uh, bells? Is that how they do it? Well, they also they <laughs> analyze in-game data, so they'll see when people start dropping off, and they'll tweak uh, the game to make that point easier to keep people right. going. I remember yeah. they have sessions at GDC, the Game Developers Conference, well, where they go through and they explain how they use psychologists to analyze this data, and they use behavioral metrics and sentiment analysis, and they really try to map behavior so that they are always giving you something to keep you on that game and making that purchase. And if you look at... Top grossing apps used to be iWork. It used to be productivity tools. And now it's all these free games where not only are you not gambling because you can't win something back, but you're literally just shoveling money into them mm. ad nauseum yeah. and item. I think we'll see more of uh, not just games using in-app purchases, but, you know, just standard applications. I mean, we've seen some like Papers for iOS. Um, that's a, a, a Papers is a good example, yeah. It's great. Yeah. And, and, you know, you can buy the additional tools. I saw another app uh, yesterday, a finance app that was uh, an accounts package, and it's a free app. You download it, mm. um, but then you can switch on unlimited transactions for, I think it was 20 quid or $20 or something. And then there's like four different uh, sort of major pieces of functionality built into the app that you can switch on. Uh, you know, as as you need them, or if you don't need them, you don't have to buy them. But you know, I can see more and more 
uh, people creating the applications that way because it, it's a way around the free trial you know you can't do a free yeah. trial through uh, through the app store or through um through the itunes app store so if you create a free app with an in-app purchase and you give people just enough functionality in the free part so they can try it out and they can sort of get a feel for whether or not it's going to uh, to be a, a good fit for them and then hit them with the in-app purchase it's it's a much better fit for all really it's we've known about this for a while the success of freemium mm -hmm. and it's interesting that the apple store probably inadvertently kind of pushed uh, push that uh, through this lack of trials, but freemium mm -hmm. really works for things like Evernote uh, and a lot of lot of apps where they give yeah. away the app. It, it was was it uh, who invented freemium? Was it was it uh, Doom? Ng Moco did it early. Zynga did it early. I, oh no, it goes back to like Doom. Where you well, share? I mean, Shareware was basically shareware, freemium. Yeah. You downloaded yeah, it and then you Commander Keen. Uh, the early the early games from ID. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, it's very interesting. I just feel a little immoral to program a game to take advantage of somebody's uh, in. Uh, yeah, that's. I, I, I think it's a very consumer. I think it's a very consumer friendly approach for productivity apps, where you know, like like Don said, you you get to test it out without having to purchase it beforehand. Also, to an extent, it lets you just buy whatever level of features you actually need. Uh, if there were an art app, I would love to be able to buy just here is a uh, for 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 free. I get a I get a red crayon and a screen that right. I can give to a kid and they can play in the back seat of the car. Uh, but as I decide that oh, it'd be really nice to be able to put a photo behind this and onion skin it and be able to trace over it, I'd be willing to pay ninety nine cents for that feature to add that. So instead of buying, buying the thirty dollar app suite, you wind up buying a sixteen dollar uh, app that only does the things you want to do. But yeah, I, I'm start I am starting to feel like Renee really. Uh, hit it on the head that it, it, the way that it's manipulating people and trying to get people to do things that they would not do if they had full control of their rational higher processes i i, I think that it's it's we're, we're we're sliding into a highly ethically troublesome area yeah. by selling apps that way i agree dan Ariely of uh, the author predictably irrational would probably say well all marketing has always done this but it doesn't feel yeah, right. Yeah, but well, so. no. I mean, I, 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 there, there, there are tricks to every sales trade. There are tricks to marketing and all that sort of stuff. The idea is that it's uh, you. But you would agree that it, it's one thing for a car salesman to not mention that. Uh, oh, by the way, I've I've put paint on the on the gas pedals. So you don't actually see the how how worn down it is. And I've actually I've I've put a couple drops of of vanilla in the back seats. So you sort of think that it's a it's a right. newer. You have a sort of sense memory thing, and that that guy saying, "I'm going to take you out and get you good and drunk." Before, yeah. <laughs> before I'll, I'll, when I take over for the test drive, I'm going to get you good and drunk. I guess we know where the push. line is. Yeah. I mean, you, you always cook, uh, you always bake cookies when you're trying to show a house. Yeah. Uh, is that, I mean, sure, that's playing on people's unconscious, you know, um, monkey mind. And yet, I don't, I think nobody would say that's crossing the line. Yeah, I think the real that. issue is with it, when it's games for kids, you know, when um, yeah, exactly. when you have in-app purchases for kids, because that's... I guess, really except that the, like, the point is that e we are as kids, we are as children, even adults, when we're confronted with these technologies that take advantage of our unconscious mind, we're as ignorant as a kid is, yeah. as unable to defend ourselves as children are. Praying to our egos and is praying to, you know, the, the, everything that makes us want to do things. And yeah. they've done a lot of research to do it. So it's not it's not that they're, they accidentally fell upon this, they're deliberately targeting it right mm -hmm. yeah it's it's like these ads you sometimes see uh, on uh, both iphone on uh, I, I see a uh, web app excuse me ads for in, inside ios apps and android apps where they know that like on ios that we often see a back button at the top right hand top left hand corner of the screen and so we're going to put an ad that has a big arrow button right where you would be aiming for if you wanted to go back out of the, this level of the game or out of this level of the app to sort of trick you into thinking, I'm not going to look at this ad. I'm just going to simply click on that button that I always click. And well, what do you know? Now you're looking at an ad or now you've just downloaded, now you've just <laughs> activated a piece of script that you didn't want to activate before. Uh, on, a, on Android, you also see the same thing where there, there's a bank of, uh, of wired in buttons at the bottom to, again, make you not really look at this, but you're, you're, you get sort of this muscle memory thing where I want, I'm done with this now. I want to go back. I will hit this thing that's familiar to me. That's just, that's just, yeah. And it's interesting because, and in, by a certain extent, good developers, like the productivity developers that Andy mentions, they've learned that, for example, people will not make in-app purchases to get rid of ads. They don't consider them annoying enough that they'll actually pay to get rid of them. I think you're right. Uh, yeah. David Barnard from AppCubby has done a lot of research on this, and he's written a lot of it up on his blog. He's done it very transparently, trying out different models, different kinds of freemium, what things people will pay for and what they won't. And it's really hard for a non for a developer who doesn't want to do these sort of shady tactics to to make good income anymore 
on the app store. It's become a very hit driven business for them. So I think that, you know, Apple has tried, they've eliminated, like you can no longer say if you download this other app, we'll give you points towards this app and you can't make your app look like an app store anymore. And they tried to making iAds. But I think as the person who owns the platform, it behooves them to take more responsibility and try to allow developers who make really high quality apps and aren't trying to to prey on people to have just a better chance of earning revenue because I still have this thing in the back of my mind of Atari ET cartridges being buried in the desert and I don't want <laughs> all the value to be taken out of Apple's app ecosystem. Yeah, this is a good... I'm just reading uh, David's uh, blog post, I Was Wrong. Is that That's one you're talking about. He, does, he has a series of them there and that was yeah. his experiment with an app called Timer where he made it free but he made one of the icons an ad and people couldn't determine... People didn't like an ad that looked like an icon because right. it felt like a cheat to them. So... That was the one that he that he was apologizing for, but he's trying a lot of different models. I I would love it if more people would uh, try these experiments and report back, not keep it to themselves. It's fantastic. Um, great way to learn, and uh, I think I mean yeah, he's apologizing, but I think it's also great. Give and freemium you know, a chance is the post before that. I think this is really interesting. Because at the end of the day, he's got to be able to feed his kids, or he's going to stop making me right. apps, and I want him to make me apps. Everybody needs to make a living. Yeah. Uh, you know, you can't say to people, hey, you should really give everything away for free. <laughs> it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work. And it's always a catch. I mean, nothing is really free. Nothing is free. Yeah. Some things are free. I don't think that's true. I think some people are dumb enough to give stuff away. <laughs> 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 well, I'll give you an example. But, but many things, they have other ways of making a living. We give our shows away. I, always, I don't want to ever have to charge for shows or any of the content that we produce, but we put ads in them. That's how we support them. Mm -hmm. Similar to television. It seems, yeah, it's, it's, it seems, free media. it seems like we're about to have like a Dr. House style conversation about uh, <laughs> doing things for others. Because on, on the one, I mean, on the one hand, you're not doing this, you're not giving them, you're giving them away for free, partly because you're a very, very good person. You're, you're doing something altruistically, but also because you know that the key to getting people to come back with their money is for them to have confidence in you and have confidence in anything they see with a, with a Twit logo on it. Uh, and uh, putting DRM on something, selling something at a very, very high price, putting obstacles between somebody and your content is going to prevent them from getting that sort of uh, uh, loyalty to you and the stuff that you do. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, look, everybody. I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I, I'm, everybody I'm, makes that calculus, but I do believe there's true altruism in the world. I mean, you do stuff. No, exactly. I mean, you, you like it's there, there's so many reasons for creators to do what they're doing. Uh, a lot of, there are a lot of folks that they they certainly would love to have a successful product, but they have that sort of uh, one, one that 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 wonderful little sector of Apple's mentality, which is we just want this great people to have this great thing that we came up with. Uh, and uh, again, if they make enough money to make their mortgage payment, absolutely wonderful. Uh, and they want to be able to sustain themselves and sustain the project. Uh, but that's like the idea of making $100,000 a year off of this one app. They know it's not a very attainable goal. So in lieu of that, they much rather charge 99 cents and make, give it as big an audience as possible. Right. So there is a certain hint of altruism there. We're going to take a break. I'm going to make some money. How about that? Hey. <laughs> Andy Inako is here from the Chicago Sun-Times. Renee Ritchie from imore.com. And, uh, of course, it's great to have Don McAllister all the way from Liverpool. He's the creator of Screencasts Online. You do the same freemium thing, too, don't you, Don? I mean, you have well, free... I do. I, yeah, if I have free... Well, it's, it's, a, it's a membership system, uh, right. but I do about once every five weeks, once every six weeks. I, I give away a, a, an episode completely free. Uh, and, again, you know, it's to give something back, but it's also to attract new members as well because people, you know, hopefully will see the free stuff and they like what they see and they'll, they'll want to get the, the weekly shows that I do. So. Heck, Yes. Why wouldn't they? Indeed. Why wouldn't they? All right, let's uh, take a break. Talk about backing up. See, this is altruistic. This isn't really. It might seem like an ad to you, but I'm trying to <laughs> save your butt by giving you a great way to back up your family photos, your financial records, your emails, anything that's on your hard drive that you don't want to lose. If you aren't backing it up, you're basically uh, just running, riding. Well, how could I describe it? Riding without a helmet. Running on empty. You're taking a huge chance. You're flying that rocket pack without any asbestos underwear. You got to get out there and back it up. And I tell you, if, if you're gonna if you're gonna back up, you're gonna want to do it three ways. You're gonna want to do it automatically, so you don't have to remember to do it because you won't. I won't. Nobody would. You got to do it continuously, so you make a change. It's backed up right away because you don't want to lag between, you know, when you create the data and when it gets preserved forever. 
And most importantly, and I think people ignore this a lot, it should be off-site. It should be away from the computer. It's good to have local backup. I do that, too. But if you don't have an off-site solution, then you're really courting disaster if the worst happens. Fire, flood, earthquake, somebody steals everything. If you've got a laptop and you leave it on the conveyor belt at the airport, that is the disaster scenario you got to plan for. That's what backing up is. And that's what Carbonite does. Unlimited backup for your Mac or PC, just $59 a year, less than 5 bucks a month. And I got to tell you, it's uh, it's it's cloud storage, too, so you can see your stuff anytime. Just log on to your Carbonite account from any computer or their smartphone apps. Those are free. And there's your stuff. So you get cloud storage. You get automatic continuous backup. They do have plans for business and uh, premier, home premiere and so forth, all at one low flat monthly rate, actually yearly rate. I want you to try it free for two weeks. You don't need to give them a credit card. Just uh, download the free trial, install it on your Mac or PC, and see what you think. Try it for two weeks. If you decide this is something you want to buy, use our offer code MACBREAK, you'll get two free months. Actually, you should use the offer code when you sign up for the free trial. And then I think and then I think you automatically get it. The alarm is going off, Renee. It's a Nuclear it says North Korea, duck and cover. <laughs> Atomic attack. Carbonite.com. Use the offer code MACBREAK. Enough said. It's all you need to know. So uh, this lawsuit, Tim Cook calls it a silly sideshow. Einhorn is uh, is saying Apple should distribute its cash. You know, Apple's got how much cash? I don't know. Billions. <laughs> billions. 20-odd in in billion. Yeah. yeah. And uh, 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 Einhorn, David Einhorn, is uh, the founder of Greenlight Capital, I guess a big stockholder. <coughs> and he's filing suit against Apple over a proposal that he says will eliminate the option of preferred stock. He wanted shareholders to vote against the proxy branding. Apple's tactics is symptomatic of someone who suffered through money troubles. I, I don't know what he's saying. Tim Cook said Tim this Cook was really funny about that today. He said, you know, I'm not mailing out proposals to people. I don't have a Prop 2 sign on my lawn. <laughs> I just think that it's fair that if Apple ever does issue preferred stock, we let the shareholders weigh in on it. That's all, that's all Apple apparently wants to do is make it something that shareholders have to vote on and that the board can't do in and of themselves. They say, uh, Einhorn says, Apple has a, a cash problem. They have so much in cash, $23 billion more last quarter, ending the period with $137.1 billion in cash. He's, he says it's like my grandma who lived through the Depression. <laughs> they, they, they're they hoarding. He says Apple is a hoarder. <laughs> they should be on uh, on Bravo or whatever. I mean, this guy's clearly only, only good at this. bundles of $100 bills <laughs> instead of dead cats. Not yeah, a bad just problem. lying around the house. Um, you know... I don't. I, anyway, I agree. I mean, who knows? I don't even care. Uh, I'm sure they'll work this out. Apple says, by the way, they have explored, uh, Tim Cook says, we have explored some major acquisitions, and we are not uh, against the idea, but we just we haven't found anything we want. He said this in the Goldman Sachs call today. Since it's interesting he said that they, uh, that they acquire an average of somebody every, every other month. So but these are little, explore, you know, acquires and things. Yeah. It's of uh, yeah. expertise Talented or technology. people or IP. Anybody who loves the company doesn't want Apple to acquire them because we think about things like La La and Siri, which Apple acquired and then gutted. Um, I don't. Generally speaking, when Facebook or Apple or Google, a lot of times when they acquire these companies, Google has a really terrible track record of basically gutting companies. Remember Jaiku, Leo? Loved Jaiku. Me too. Don't get me started on Jaiku. It was a Twitter uh, early Twitter replacement. Yeah. That I, uh, it was, it actually was kind of going under and I discovered it and I told everybody, oh, I'm moving to Jaiku. This is, this is when I left Twitter. It's so much better, but nobody, nobody believed me. <laughs> so anyway. So the only thing that's interesting is if Apple could buy a company that would give them a springboard into services, the kind that Amazon and Google and Facebook run, you know, really high scale, high reliability, high availability server side technology. But it, it's almost impossible to think of a company that's next like enough that Apple could do to their services and web objects, what they did to OS 9 uh, and OS 10. Um. I made everyone sad. No, no. <laughs> I'm just looking for another story. I don't know. Yeah. Anything else we haven't uh, haven't talked about? We talked about the watch. Apple's iPads were neutered for the U.S. government. <laughs> Come here, boy. 
Come here, boy. <laughs> no. No, I'm sorry. I, 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 I those off that might solve the supply problems. I'm not sure if that's a far thinking strategy. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned, Andy, and I think you did it in jest, but uh, some iPhone users are saying the new 6.1 of iOS is draining their battery faster, causing overheating as well. I don't have we heard much about that. Mm, I've heard I've heard a couple complaints from users about that. It, it, it looks like that. It looks like the. It seems like every time there's a major update to the OS, mm -hmm. there is some sort of use case in which someone is either their GPS is disappearing or their Wi-Fi is disappearing or yeah. they're getting a battery drain. I think Vodafone, as a matter of fact, uh, issued. Uh, uh, didn't they? Was that last week that they were telling their users, please don't yeah. update right now because for some reason the latest update is knocking out our access to 4G. So just hold, just hold steady for now. We're, that we're, was we're arguing iPhone with Apple 4S only. Yeah, that was 4S, right. And that was patched in the update yesterday, the 6.1.1 yep. update. Okay. And they've just announced it's okay to upgrade, so Vodafone's given a big thumbs up for that. So. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, they that, have exchange that's, issues, too. Yeah. Well, that, that's an advantage that uh, that uh, that Apple will always have over Android and everybody else. I mean, if I, if uh, if on my Samsung phone, if it started, if GPS started dropping out, I know that oh, damn it. So now AT and T is going to have to argue with Samsung, which is going to have to argue with Google over where the problem is and who has to fix it. Whereas Apple is going to be sufficiently shamed into saying we will do an update. That update will go out to all users. It will be fixed in due course. You don't have to. It, it might take us a while to locate the problem and fix it, but it will get fixed, and everybody will get that fix. Yeah, we used to joke about Palm OS updates taking like twelve, you know, twelve years to get through Palm and the individual carriers. So it's it's a whole different world now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, Apple changed. That's the one. That's something Apple successfully changed, right? I think and Andy's absolutely right. Every time there's a firmware upgrade, there's a percentage of people who suddenly have battery right. issues or one of those issues. And often it might just be because the restore process that ha that happens in the background, something gets corrupted. There's some cruft that builds up. There's some extra notifications going on or some extra GPS hits. Or it's having a harder time finding a radio. So the device gets hot and it drains. And most of the time, if you just restore as a new iPhone, as big a pain in the butt as it is, that fixes most of that stuff. Mm. Tim Cook says, I never wanted to sue Samsung. It was that stupid Steve Jobs. I mean, <laughs> he, he says, uh, according to people with knowledge of the matter, uh, Cook worried that, be and Cook is the supply guy, right? He worried that uh, Samsung would cut him off on uh, critical components for the iPhone and the iPad. But Steve, according to this uh, story in Reuters, <laughs> had run out of patience suspecting that Samsung was counting on the supplier relationship to, sub to shield it from retribution. I sort of get the impression that they, that Steve probably took it more personally than Tim Cook. Yeah, Tim does not seem like the guy that takes things personally. No, no, but, you know, what was the famous quote that Steve said about going thermonuclear against right. uh, Android and whatever. So I think he did, he did take those sort of things very personally, whereas yes. I think Tim's a little bit more detached and uh, sees things from a, a higher plane. But now he's stuck, right? Because, they, they, I mean, it's too late. You can't, you can't say, oh, never mind. Or could you? There's, there's, it, there's an interesting difference. I mean, and Horace Dedio had a really good post on this where he said that, you know, basically Apple taught Google how to make smartphone software and they taught Samsung how to manufacture massive quantities of phones right. by pushing through all that stuff. And now those two companies are their biggest competitor. But there's a huge difference between, uh, you know, being tactically smart enough to learn and adapt these things and legal theft. And, you know, you can be really upset and really angry and you can have legacy issues about Microsoft stealing your PC technology and that can... Because companies are people that can influence your decision making. Right. But at the end of the day, these are just, you know, Google and Samsung were really smart and they pivoted really, really fast. Finally, Alicia Keys, who I didn't know this, but is apparently the <laughs> global creative director for BlackBerry. She, was, she came up on stage during the BlackBerry 10 announcement. But apparently she's still tweeting from her iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> and now she, she says, oh, no, I was hacked. Yeah. That was she sad. should talk to Anthony Weiner before she Those really pursues Chinese. that. <laughs> pursues that line. I didn't post that. It, I was hacked. Whoopsies. Yeah. It was well, an interesting the, week because Steven Sanofsky a, a couple weeks ago was posting from an Android device and then uh, Joe Fiore, who runs UI for Windows Phone, was posting from an Android phone on Twitter. And it seems like Twitter is this place where everyone experiments with different phones. People, I think, often don't understand that uh, when they tweet, you could see what client they used. 
and uh, sees it, the it web interface. Seems to bite them. <laughs> yeah, because well, Twitter got rid yeah, of that. They didn't want anyone to know there were other clients. So maybe if you're just looking at official <laughs> Twitter apps or the Twitter website, you think you're incognito. That's right. But those of us who still use Tweetbot. Tweetbot tells you. you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> At the same time, can we, can we get a little past this? It's yeah. A, there's also there's a I forget who it was a few months ago who had who wrote the exact same problem and it had to be explained to the entire world that Oprah. Yeah. You know, well, yeah. I wasn't. I don't think I'm not thinking of Oprah specifically, but it's like, yeah, I have to I have to explain to you that I have a team of four people right. who do my social media. So oftentimes it's me who's tweeting. Sometimes it's because I've told my assistant to please tweet out this at a certain time and a certain day because I've agreed to do so. Maybe they didn't use the iPhone. Maybe they didn't use the Android phone. Maybe they didn't use the right phone. But you know what? Just give it a rest. Yeah. I mean, sure, certainly that's what happened. I keep checking I've Andy's feed for when his assistants mess up. <laughs> Excuse me? I keep checking Andy's phone for when his assistants mess up, but I haven't caught him yet. <laughs> Have you missed up? Have you missed up recently? <laughs> Did you post from a surface? <laughs> Finally, before he died, according I'd to business... I'd be pleased to post from a surface. It's a quality product. <laughs> it is. Do you have your surface lying about? Uh, indeed, I do. Is it the Surface Pro? It is indeed the Pro. Ah, so. look at that. One of the rare ones. You're going to do it down, Sunday? Because that's what people rare, do when they have One of the rare ones that's been used within the past 48 hours? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, they sold out of the 128 gig. You can't even order it yeah. anymore in the, uh, in the Microsoft Store. Yeah, I mean, you definitely want the 128 gig. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's 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 a, it's a fine product. It's not it's not for everybody yet. It's good, but it's I, I don't. I was kind of disappointed that it got real like Zune one type reviews because it, it was it was it was one of those days where I'm re, I, I posted my review and I read everybody else's review and I had to go back to my review saying was I high to not see that this was a horrible horrible product or is there's expectations these other people have that I do not have. <laughs> well, they, I mean, Microsoft said it was no compromise and every review hit them for it being compromised. Yeah, well, it was yeah. probably, a, it was a dumb thing to say because it set the stage for all those reviews. Yeah, because yeah, the, the iPad is a compromised product. I mean, everything's yeah, a absolutely. compromised product. Yeah. Uh, and finally, before he died, according to uh, Nick Bolton, Nick Bilton, <laughs> not Michael Bolton, Nick Bilton, uh, that I watch story, this is a little low, lower down below the fold. He uh, he told John Markoff of the New York Times if he'd had more energy, he would have liked to take on Detroit with an Apple car. <laughs> mm. I think Jobs, toward the end, he just, he was at this point, he's going, I'm going to screw with him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to make a car and a watch and a bike and an espresso maker and... I just hope that my zero gravity point singularity spaceship gets finished in time for me to see the first launch. And I, I and I just hope those damn regulators don't prevent us from actually having to be able, be able to show off and ship it because those damn regulators would prevent us from showing it publicly. Did you know, though, that Eddie Q is on the board of Ferrari? I did not know that. Yes. <laughs> and Phil Schiller in his Twitter bio says he's into Apple, sports, cars, and science. Yeah, so that doesn't help you at all, but I just throw, I throw that They in. all own cars, Leo. Where does they, the money they go? They all own cars. <laughs> now we know where that $137 billion is going. Let's take a break. When we come back, your picks and tweets and tips of the week. But first, a word from Ring Central, a tip about our phone system. What a great phone system we have here at the Brick House. One of the problems uh, when we moved from the cottage, in the cottage, I made everybody use their cell phone. Use your cell phone, I said. What do you think I am? Made of money? But uh, as we got to be a bigger business, I realized, you know, I actually have to put phones on people's desks. And I was kind of thinking, I don't, I don't, what am I going to put a PBX in the basement and contract with the phone company? And it's going to cost me a mint. And then uh, Russell, our IT guy, said, you know, I've installed Ring Central on a bunch of our clients and they seem to like it. It's cloud based. Maybe you want to take a look. We did, we installed it. We've got Ring Central phones everywhere. In fact, it's kind of cool because my phone is like a traditional two line desk phone. Conference Room has the Polycom, you know, traditional conference phone. But then a lot of the producers have a phone that basically looks like the home cordless phone. They can carry it around and walk around. Um, it, and it's fantastic. We can do all sorts of things with a Ring Central account you can't do with a PBX. Uh, phone calls can uh, originate from your smartphone using the Ring Central app. They now have business text, too. This is kind of interesting. Um, more and more we're using text to communicate with people. Let's say we've got a, an interview coming up on triangulation. We want to text the guy, hey, we're about to talk to you. 
You don't want to do that from your cell phone, your private phone, but with the Ring Central app, you can send the text from our 800 number. It looks like it came from Twit. A uh, response comes in on the 800 number, goes to your phone. Of course, all calls can go to your cell phone or go to voicemail uh, and then to your email. You can send faxes, receive faxes. Um, I just think this is, this is, of course, much more flexible because it's a cloud-based phone system. New features are added just kind of automatically. There's zero startup cost. Uh, there's no hardware to install or maintain. You just buy a phone and plug it into the wall. It works so easily. Complete customization of our phone tree and everything. And, uh, and it's as low as $20 per month per user, and that includes long distance. It is a great deal. Call 800. We have a special number for you. 800-543-9980 to do a, a free 30-day trial. Or you could visit ringcentral.com and enter the promo code TWIT. You'll get 30 days free. And a special offer, when you buy one desk phone, you'll get a second phone free, up to 20 phones total. So you can save on your phones as well. Ringcentral.com. Use the promo code TWIT or call 800-543-9980. There it is, 800-543-9980. I can tell you, a year and a half in. How long have we been here? About a year and a half, right? No more than that now. It's almost two years. <gasps> Holy cow. Uh, we are still very happy with Ring Central. Ringcentral.com. Give it a try today. So uh, I'm going to start because I've got it all set up. I was t taking a little energy to set up my HBO Go on my iPad. I've been watching a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, Veep on here, but notice they've added a new feature. Finally, I can AirPlay it. Let me get that AirPlay icon and see if I can get it to the brick house. Can you can you play this back now? If I play this here, can you pull up Brick House on your switcher? That's our Apple TV, right? So now this is, I don't know why they didn't have this before. I guess because they didn't want to compete with themselves or something. But now I can watch Veep on my iPad or any HBO on my iPad. And then I can transfer it over to my uh, Apple TV and start watching it uh, there. Let's see what it looks like. Does it I'm look, not, uh, it looks you're like, not seeing it? Yeah, I try to hit that thing again because usually it. when it airplays, it stops the iPad version. Oh, it's blue. Uh, you're right. One hard, I hate tiny tap targets. One tiny tap it says brick, brick House. Huh. Well, over here, I'm not getting it. So never mind. It doesn't work for It doesn't work <laughs> quite yet. Or maybe we I'm on a different... You know what? I'm probably on a different Wi-Fi. Production? But I'm seeing Brick House. Yeah. So that wouldn't make any sense. Well, so much for that. <laughs> Try it at home. See if it works at home. <laughs> uh, if not, we know why they did it. Yeah, because it doesn't work. I like HBO Go because I do like the idea that I can, you know, of course, with HBO Go, uh, everywhere but Norway, you have to be an HBO subscriber through a cable company. So this way they don't put themselves out of business. Um, the cable companies assist on that. But it does mean I can watch HBO on my uh, iPad. And now, in theory, if I've got an Apple TV, I don't have to have a cable hooked up to it. And you should be getting a channel for HBO on your Apple TV fairly soon, too. Yes, right. That's that's not part of the new update. Not yet, no. But it's coming soon. Soon, yeah. Soon. Obviously, they're they're inching their way towards this. Why is Scary this not? Future. I don't know. It, you're, you're right. On, it should stop it, shouldn't it? Yeah, you're on the production network, though. I am on the right network. It that. thinks it's it's airplane to the brick house. Let me take it back and switch it over again. Sometimes if the uh, Apple... T oh, I hate these tiny tap targets. One of the problems is that media companies usually don't want to use the built-in Apple control, so they recreate their own... Yeah, to be more nice, huh? Isn't that smart? Then, Makes yeah, it so much... There it goes. Now it's now it froze. No? Now it's <laughs> She's yeah. complaining about all of the... Here. Yeah, what? Play. Play, damn you! <laughs> Maybe it's only audio, because there was a... Are you there, hearing the audio? Well, I... I I don't have that over. No, you're not. It's not. How could it only be audio? But but there was a there was a little audio button if you when you stopped and over started. the last several years, HBO is making a stream of the addition of AirPlay, and uh, the rumor, of course, that they'll be rolling out a standalone app for Apple TV. Huh? Could just be buggy launch day stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Someday. Yeah. Andy Anaka, what's your pick of the week, sir? Uh, my pick is a free app that I started playing with uh, four days ago. Unfortunately, I was writing up until I, I was I was working on a piece up and just up until like uh, three thirty seconds before coming down to the studio. So I don't have a demonstration I can show you. Uh, but it's a sculpting three D sculpting app called Sculptress uh, from Pixelogic dot com, uh, and it's just a very very it's have you ever just like sort of uh, you just got a hunk of plasticine and you just keep 
mushing it and squishing it and just playing with it without any real purpose. You're just sort of like, you know, working with it and just seeing what happens. Uh, it's that like, it's that kind of app for 3D modeling where if you're a professional designer, I'm sure you could develop really wonderful models with it. Uh, you can also paint models. It's, it's, it, is a, it is like a junior edition of a professional product that they're hoping that you might want to buy later on. Uh, it's, it's, it's another one of those freemium sort of things, uh, I think, where if you learn the tools for Sculptress, maybe you will spend you will want to apply those skills towards another Pixelogic uh, app uh, later on in the future. But the idea is that it really is the least intimidating uh, 3D sculpting app uh, I've ever played with because you can just play with it. You can start with a primitive and just start pushing and pulling at it until you suddenly have, hey, look, it's a goblin. So I wonder if the goblin wants to have a mohawk. Hey, look, the goblin has a mohawk now. I wonder what the <laughs> goblin looks like from the back. Oh, it looks like someone gave the goblin the back of his head. Ooh, let's give him a little <laughs> crease in the middle of his, in the middle of the back of his skull. There he's now. He's got a crease in the back of his skull. And it's a, and then three hours later, you realize, oh, that piece that I should have written three hours ago is now <laughs> still haven't been fun because I've made a painted version of a goblin that now I can't use. Uh, but the uh, the the other nice thing is that it's not just a simple demo app. Uh, it is like a full-featured app in and of itself. So that if you do find out that you have accidentally built something kind of cool and you want to export it as a model so you can use it in other apps, you can export it, you can handle it with other apps. Uh, really cool, and you can't beat the price. It's free. Uh, all it costs you is your personal information. They do want your email address before they'll uh, send you a download code. But uh, good stuff. It's fun, really fun to play with. Sculptris, S-C-U-L-P-T-R-I-S. Pixel Logic is the company that did ZBrush so many years ago, yeah. which was is is it still it's still out? It looks like I can't believe so. Yeah, neat. Um, and how and it's freemium. You said. And well, I'm sorry. I meant I was. It's I was free. Joking free, free. It's, it's free. I mean, I, I first came across it after uh, looking at one of my uh, uh, a comic artist blog. Uh, who uh, normally builds clay models when they're going to be involved in a very, very long project so that they can see if a, a character from whatever angle they wanted to pick it from. And they decide, well, I'm going to try this app. And two, two and a half, three hours later, they had pretty much the models they wanted. Uh, and they were surprised by how quick it is. I think pa Paolo Rivera, I think he also, he, he's a really great uh, artist on, uh, uh, he's, he's done Spider-Man, he's, uh, he's done Daredevil. He's uh, really one of my favorite artists. I think he was also using sculptures for a lot of these same things. Uh, so it's a very it's a very playable app. That's what gets me. You actually have to have uh, ability to use these things. It just drives me. No, crazy. I mean, well, I mean, you start you start off by just getting a hunk of clay and whacking at it, and then you know, just <laughs> like you start your your first drawing is a piece of paper and a, and a crayon, and the first hundred pieces are crap. Your first <laughs> thousand are kind of okay. The first ten thousand have promise, but once you get those ten thousand awful ones behind you, as long as, long as you have fun. Uh, you you'll be promoted uh, you're promoted within yourself to try to do the second thing, which is going to be a little bit better than the, than the last one. Kind of the story. At least, at least this one. At least this one. What, what, what I'm what I'm recommending this this piece is that I've used a lot of different 3D apps where all I wanted to do was I don't even. It's like okay, I, here, here's what here's what I want to make because I, I I make a lot of like simple furniture like around the around the office and I'll like, I'll often model it first. So it's like okay. I've got a one by two. I want to fix it <laughs> to this little panel right here. I want to know if I should put another spar here or here. Okay, so let's. Uh, here's a piece of. Uh, it's one and a half inches by wide. It is three quarters of an inch thick. Oh wait, no, it's not a cube. Okay, do I have to. Why do uh, I have to extrude it? I can't. Okay, fine, I'm extruding it. Okay, I don't want an eight foot long. I just want something this big. Okay, no. What if I actually? It's like you actually make like, furniture. Is this something I'm learning about you for the first time? You make your own. Uh, it's it's saying it's it's a bit much to call it furniture. Uh, <laughs> more more like I, I've uh, right in front of me right now is in fact a uh, the latest project, which is sort of an easel sort of thing. So I I have like one, two, three tablets in my phone That's on cool. top of it. Uh, and it's exactly the right height, and it's exactly the right angle. And when I actually want, went out shopping for something like this, I couldn't find the thing that I wanted. Uh, and the th closest thing was like $300. And I thought, okay, look, I can build it out of pine and, and, and get it to actually work. Once it's once I've got the proportions right, then I can remake it out of maple and do it right. Uh, Are these and, skills you learned in woodshop in high school? or? Uh, woodshop, uh, partly woodshop, partly my dad. We did a lot of unlicensed That's contracting neat. for for, uh, <laughs> for the family. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I uh, yeah, I, I get know. the Anatco edition out back. I, I know how to, we, we did we did a lot we did a lot of things that might not be up to code if, uh, if, if, that, if those houses ever got sold. I think that's great. That's really yeah. cool. Uh, Renee Ritchie, you got a pick for us? 
I do. And my pick is in honor of uh, the Lunar New Year because that Ooh. kicked off this weekend. Dong Hei Fat Choi. Dong Hei Fat Choi. <laughs> and uh, I think like you, Leo, I, I spent a lot of my college years doing Chinese studies. Oh, um, I didn't know that. That's neat. Yeah. My Mandarin is much worse than my French, though. <laughs> yeah, mine <laughs> so, too. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I, I mean, I spent a lot of my, my 20s in Chinatown. I went to China a few times and I've always really enjoyed the culture. Me and too. The, yeah. the, what I could find uh, for... The Lunar New Year is this case from Element Case. It's called the Ronin. And it was actually, they have an edition that was specifically made for the Lunar New Year. Uh. And they make a lot of high-end, usually racing-inspired cases. But this one was inspired by Asian sword making. Whoa. So it's got <laughs> woods and it's got uh, metal and screws. And it comes with a nice little uh, pouch. It comes with a variety of backs yeah, tell them how much it is so that you understand what you're, what you're, yeah, what so you're this getting. Is, this is an it. Alex Lindsay uh, level pick. So it's, it's a $200 iPhone case. Wow. I didn't, I didn't want to I didn't want to lead with the lead on this one. Um, and, and there's a more expensive just, just, version that has just, actual gold on it. Whoa. Just for, just for context, if you were to drop your phone into a toilet or off a cliff, how much would the Apple store cost you to replace it? 200 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, it's it's not for the fact. You could beautiful, arguably beautiful buy an here. iPod Nano and stick that in a red envelope and go about your business. <laughs> uh, but if if you want to celebrate the Lunar New Year in style, uh, this is just, this is a nice sort of uh, an ode to that culture. I want to get the gold one now. Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, the gold one is pricey. Pretty, 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 pretty. It's a nickel plated aluminum uh, CNC machine exotic wood rails. Made out of the, uh, what is that? How do you pronounce that tree? I do not know some how to pronounce of, that. <laughs> some sort of unpronounceable wood. And leather and ultra suede back plates. And then they do have a gold edition as well. But it's, it's interesting wow. to see, and we saw this at Macworld and at CES Zeri as Coach. well, is that the it used to be everyone just wanted the quick, cheap little plastic bumper right. uh, for their iPhone. But now companies are making, a Casemate was making gem inlays and, and you know wood inlays, and they're really experimenting with materials. And instead of just making something that's utilitarian, everyone's using the iPhone as a platform to express their own designs and their own fashions. And I think it's really interesting. Very nice. Very nice. Mr. Uh, Don McAllister of Screencasts Online, your pick of the week. Well, mine, mine's a lot cheaper than that one. Mine's <laughs> actually a free app. Um, oh, I like it. It's free app for the, uh, for the iPhone and the iPad. Now, we've got AirDrop on OS X, and that's quite a handy thing to have. If you have multiple Macs, you can just use AirDrop. But, of course, if you've got your iPhone or your iPad, that doesn't appear within AirDrop. So uh, there's a new app out called InstaShare, which is sort of like AirDrop between iOS and also OS 10. And they've got the iPhone app at the moment. They're working on an iPad app. And there's also a free OS 10 uh, menu bar thing that you stick in the menu bar. But it's just super simple. It's really easy. Basically, you just, uh, uh, to transfer a file from your, your Mac to your iOS device, you just go to the menu bar, tap open the window, drag the file to it, let go. It has a look on the network to see what other iOS devices have got the application running. You drop it on the particular device, and it just it just works. It's great, and it's not Neat. restricted to any particular file type. It's not um, you, know, you can use any file. I think there's a new version come out, which uh, mm. also allows you to transfer folders as well. But it's both ways as well. So on the on your iOS device, you open up the uh, the application. Um, it gives you access, and you can just drag a file in. And or if you're in another application, say you're in um, a PDF reader application, you want to send that across to your Mac. You click the share button, and it appears in the list of applications you can share with share with InstaShare. And then it will appear on your Mac. It's uh, it's really really nice, and it's free. Uh, there is uh, it's supported by app um, ads, i ads. But if you pay sixty nine p or ninety nine cents, you can get rid of the ads. And I did it within about thirty seconds of actually downloading the application. I thought this is a uh, this is for me. I'm sorry, I'm a little distracted because my pick of the week <laughs> is the edible arrangement <laughs> for Valentine's Day. Which is going quickly. I don't know if there'll be much left after. <laughs> Save one for me. <laughs> Raid. There's. They said it. They said online. It said uh, pineapple-shaped hearts, and I don't know what that is, but I think they meant heart-shaped pineapple. Anyway, that's, that's happy Valentine's right. Day, everybody. <laughs> it's so great to have you all, Don. It's great to talk to you. I'm sorry we didn't see you when you were in town, but I'm glad we could get you on via Skype. It's almost mm -hmm. as good as being there. Well, that's right. That's and you right. won't catch my cold that way. Don, okay. is that screencast online? What's your latest screencast? 
Um, I'm just working on one this week. I can't, you know what? Oh, I actually did. Um, I actually did an airplay one last week. I actually oh, because a lot of these screencast online viewers can't come to MacWorld. I actually did a special version of the presentation I gave at MacWorld on airplay. So uh, that that was quite interesting. And I'm still doing a, a weekly iOS uh, tutorial as well. Um, but I also have the magazine. So if people uh, want to check out the magazine in the newsstand, they can just search for Screencast Online Monthly. The, the, uh, it's an iPad magazine. In, in, in it is. It's in newsstand. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Very cool. Great to talk to you, Don. Thank you for being here. Well, thank thanks to Renee Ritchie. He's here almost every week now. iMore.com. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much, Leo. Stay warm. Try and burning Andy's books as fast as I can. Uh, everybody's saying that the... Uh, the series you did on Evasion, the new uh, jailbreak for 6.1, was excellent. A must oh, thank read. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fun to be able to jailbreak again after a, a long drought. Yeah, we talked about it last week. This is the most downloaded jailbreak ever in history. I mean, millions yeah. of people downloaded it. It's kind of an interesting thing. And the stuff available is really, because iOS 6 added a lot of basic features, you'd think there's not much left to do. But some of the tweaks that the really smart jailbreak developers have come up with uh, are really impressive. Yeah. So worth doing. Uh, it's worth doing if if something frustrates you about your iPhone, if you came from another platform or there's just something that you want to do that you can't. And even if it's just change the theme or add five icons to your dock or use gestures like the iPad on your iPhone, um, these all these little enhancements. And because you can just restore and go back to stock uh, immediately if you want to, it's very low risk. Eve, evasion is spelled with a zero instead of an O, but otherwise it's evasion.com. And it is a uh, simple one-click Jailbreak. But I would, before I do it, I would read absolutely read the series of articles at imore.com. And it's a brilliant, just a, the jailbreak itself is a brilliant piece of engineering to get around everything that Apple's done to, <laughs> to seal off the system. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Um, Andy Anako from the Chicago Sun Times and uh, a regular also on Mac Break Weekly, hiding right now between time the chocolate dipped fruit. We'll just slide that over. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thank you for at least putting me within proximi proximity of something delicious. <laughs> this really is good stuff. <laughs> I gotta say. Does uh, do someone love you? Mm. So, <laughs> someone, someone, you got a Can sweet heart you? Actually, I gave it to her and she gave it back. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's love. Uh, uh, we do the show every Tuesday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC on twit.tv. Do watch live if you can. If not, please download it after the fact. We make uh, on-demand versions available on all the uh, better podcast platforms or at twit.tv slash mbw. Happy Fat Tuesday, by the way. Mardi Gras. And uh, we'll see you next week. Now get back to work because break time is over. Would you like some chocolate-dipped fruit? <laughs> <laughs>